This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to the northeast corner of sunny South Africa. That is an elephant. My name is James and this is Safari Live. So some elephants there, everybody, on this your sunset safari on Sunday. That is a lot of S's. It's wonderful to be with you. We are, of course, live. I am very relaxed on my Sunday afternoon. Brian is on camera today. Brian, what is the thumb today? The thumb is the sun. A sunny sun thumb. On Sunday. On Sunday. Good. Then, on the other vehicle, we have got Taylor. She's being filmed by David and his, well, I mean, his black locks become more and more impressive every time I see him. And then quite the opposite, of course, Stefan Winterboer, without any locks whatsoever, is out on foot. And he's being filmed by Jean Dre, whose locks, well, the less said about them, the better. Also, Herbert is helping them. This, on my head, is an experimental hat. It is, of course, utterly ridiculous, uh, but it does serve a purpose. It has a microphone sewn into it. It's very uncomfortable, and so I shall probably wear it like that for most of the afternoon, which will either make you laugh or turn your screen off, I hope, rather the, um, the former. Good. Let's have a look at the elephants again. We are, of course, completely live. Hashtag Safari Live if you want to talk to us on Twitter. If you'd like to email us, questions at wildearth.tv. It would be good to hear your comments and questions that you have there. As I've said to you before, carrier pigeons, not to be used in this area. We have a number of predatory birds that will probably eat your carrier pigeon before it arrives in the final control to hand over to the people directing today, which are, of course, Rebecca Christensen on, in my ear. and tapping away at the keys, Louise the sunburn pavid. Those elephants, uh, from what I'm told, there are lots of elephants around the place at the moment, and uh, those ones, of course, are being particularly unconfiding. They found a piece of bush that they want to eat, and so they are not coming out to say hello to us, which, of course, is very unkind of them. Is it not, Brian? Yes, indeed. Now, we've come into this area, everybody, hoping to find sign of the great queen, who, while I was away, was very kind. She uh, came here and murdered two impalas. So she wasn't very kind to them, of course, but she was very kind to all of us because she displayed great play behavior, apparently, with her two youngsters, uh, Hosanna and uh, Schwangile. And, well, you know, it's not too long now before probably Schwangile especially decides that she's had enough of the comforts of home and perhaps she'll move on. It's quite interesting to think to me as to where she's going to set up a territory. I suspect either the northern, northeastern section of Juma heading in Torchwood, otherwise down south she'll push, probably wedge herself between Tandi and Shadow, but who knows? Time will tell. Little Hosanna has a little bit more time at home, of course, because he is a male and therefore likes the comforts of home cooking and the comforts that his mummy will give him. Good. Well, Brian, out of the, uh, all of the elephant sightings we've had, I'm going to say that that wasn't the top elephant sighting I've ever had. Uh, what do you think? Um, mm. uh, bottom five. Bottom five, I would say, yes. Yeah, certainly some bottoms there. We're going to head on towards Treehouse Dam and see what we can find there. I am, of course, back in the Jigger after many, many months. Jigger, for those of you who don't know, perhaps you're a new viewer, is uh, this Land Rover that I'm driving. A deeply ancient and aged piece of machinery that should possibly have been retired about 20 years ago, but we still keep running with a mixture of cable ties, gaffer tape and many prayers. Oh, I wonder if I'm still hearing the final control. Final control, do you copy us? There we are. She is still there. Thank goodness. Phew. 
the stroke of luck. It's got a little bit greener since I was away. You had a little bit of rain while I was gone, just on the brief seven days that I was away, and it really is amazing. I, I love going away for a week or two at a time and coming back and seeing the changes. All of the Combritums have now flushed, and I'm sure that they're creating a great deal of excitement amongst the browsing antelope and uh, the non-browsing antelope. That's not what I meant. I meant the animals that are not antelope that browse. The non-antelope browsers, yes, such as the elephant. This hat truly is rather horrific. I think it was built for a unicorn. Not so bad. Not so bad. Okay, good. I don't know how Jamie managed to wear it. Anyway, I think Jandre's final wish of creating a hat system that will hold the microphone has finally come to fruition. Great joy and rapture unforeseen. We will be having a fireside chat today, and the fireside chat will take place from quarter past six Central African time until half past six, so 15 minutes. It will be hosted by the inimitable, elegant antelope Jamie Patterson, and we're going to be discussing the Birmingham boys and the names thereof. Let's head across to Stier van Winterboer, find out where he's being mystic in the wilderness. Good afternoon and welcome to the bushwalk this afternoon. Yes, you're on foot with myself, Steph Winterboer, and jean on camera today. And right off the bat, we've got something very, very interesting to show you. Something that I've never really seen before, at least never realized I was seeing before. This, of course, is something that you are quite, quite uh, familiar with. It's a pile of dung and a pile of, well, and, and markings of some urine. It's a female elephant. And I know that because the dung pile and the urine pile are quite close together. But what is interesting is I can tell from this pile of urine and this pile of dung that this elephant has recently had a baby. Have a look at what gave it away for us. This telltale blood that has basically fallen on the ground after this act. And it's even gone so far as to stain the stick. It's a little bit of mucus that's got a little bit of blood on it. And while we think that this is postnatal, so once, once, this little, once this little elephant has, uh, has been born, and we're just using basically just, just some deduction. We do know that elephant cows bleed for quite some time after they've had a baby, and that's because an elephant's birth canal is this really weird shape. And it's quite difficult for female elephant to have babies and to give birth. And that birthing act sometimes damages them inside, and they will bleed for quite some time after giving birth. But what's quite nice to see is we've got that whole story written out for us right here. Urine, dung, blood. Quite macabre, but one thing that we have been seeing on drives for the last couple of days is a lot of baby elephant. And I don't know, elephant mothers are pregnant for 22 months. I don't quite know if there is uh, a, a calving season for elephants. They do have and seem to have an increase in births in summer when there's a lot of vegetation around. But this time of the year, Oh, you know, th I think this is just one of those lucky times when we seem to have a lot of elephant herds around. Elephant herds sort of constantly have newborn babies entering into the herd. And I think this is just one of those signs that we're seeing at the moment of this gradual influx or gradual increase of baby elephant. Now that does that. We're going to carry on with our walk now. And uh, that's what we're doing right now and right this afternoon. We're on foot for those of you who are joining us for the first time. We are unencumbered. We are unassisted. It's just three of us on foot. And our plan today is to head noses into the wind and uh, head towards our northern boundary, basically. All right, now there's a lot of, of tracks and sign of elephant. Just around this particular tree, we have probably three or four different species of antelope and elephant. We've got elephant, rhinoceros, hmm, let's see what else we've got over here. Giraffe, we've got impala, buffalo. Wow, 
A lot has been here. Warthogs. Impala. Now, Sierra, while we're busy looking at what tracks and signs have occurred over here, you've asked me a question. When do elephant, let's hope this the branch doesn't break out. When do elephant get tusks? Sierra, elephant have two different sets of tusks. They have a set of tusks that come out and start growing soon after they're born. They erupt a little bit and then they fall out, just like your teeth do or did when you were, when you were younger. The Milk tusks, as they're called, will fall out just before they are a year old, and then their adult tusks emerge from about one year old. So you're looking at about 12 to 16 months is when you get those first tusks developing. Females have a constant growth rate. Their tusks grow at a constant rate throughout their lives. Males have an acceleration of tusk growth rate. So by the time an elephant bull is at the end of his life, when he's around about 55 to 65 years old, those tusks are growing at the fastest. And so your oldest elephant are also the elephant that have the biggest and longest tusks. And on that note, I think the South Africa and the Kruger National Park have on average the bulls with the biggest and longest and heaviest tusks of all the elephant in all the national parks that we have around here. So the biggest tusked bulls at the moment most of them occur in the Kruger National Park. There are a few other parks of note. Uh, Amboseli has a couple of really big, that's in Kenya, has, has a couple of really big elephants. Some of the forest elephant that I've seen pictures of, Brent has seen one or two of them, are true giants. But it's difficult to judge how big those tusks are because they're relatively smaller bodied. Um, and uh, there's one or two other places that have large tusk elephants, but nowhere like the Kruger National Park has as many large, big, tusked bulls as what we have over here. Nice question there, Sienna. All right, let's carry on over here and see what this walk has in store for us. Now, a day like today has, where, where it's blustery and it's close to a dam. We're quite close to Juma at the moment, probably about half a mile away. Um, we've got to be really, really careful about walking. October is the month when the most accidents happen out here in bush, in the foot, uh, or on foot at least anyway, and it's where we're going to be most careful. So thickets like this, we want to try and look and listen. We're going to keep the wind in our face. We'll keep nice and safe today for you. Well, that's the aim anyway. And I think on that note, we are going to pass you along to James for an update. Equilla Rapax, everybody. The tawny eagle is sitting in a dead tree and I think it's quite a young one and you can tell that from its blotchy appearance and when we saw it fly up there it's got all sorts of white flat white kind of um, white patches on the back of its wings and on its back sorry everybody I paused there because something very strange came through my ear Uh, right, okay. We're just doing some communications tests at the moment, everybody, because we have new radios, which are very technically sophisticated. Oh, this eagle is so beautiful. Now, let me just give you an idea of the size, probably about two and a half feet tall. I'm going to check that in case I'm telling you a lie. For Brian, we all know from our mummies that... Lying is bad, isn't it? It is, it is bad. Not so, lying. unless you're a psychopath, lying is bad. Yeah. So, let me just quickly check that I'm not being a psychopath. <laughs> it is 71 centimeters, which, Brian, you will find is almost two and a half feet, slightly under two and a half feet. A, white a small, I would call it a white lie, yes. Uh, I don't know what that is, Alex. I don't know which channel is Bushwalk Channel. Sorry, everybody. I'm getting uh, very difficult communications from Final Control here. Then we also have some giraffe, which I'll drive forward and show you now. And, of course, the tawny eagle is a largely a scavenger. <laughs> right, let's move a little bit forward, Brian to the giraffe. There are two giraffes and I'm rather hoping they're going to come down and drink at Treehouse Lake 
which is now a puddle, which is certainly more than it's been for the last little while. Hello, young bull. How goes your Sunday? Ah, Rebecca says yesterday you saw 15 giraffe. I'm not sure if she's telling me that because she thinks this is a rather, well, subpar sighting or if she's just telling me so that I might be excited. But 15 giraffe is an extremely impressive sighting, especially for this part of the world. I might have to take a photograph, Brian. I quite like the grey sky in the background, don't you? Yes. Marvellous. Wonderful. Awesome. Fantastic. Incredible. Rad. Magnificent. Stupendous. Stupendiferous. <laughs> anyway, I think he might go down and have a drink, so it's probably worth just sitting here for a little while. Go on, don't worry about us, we're just watching you. We're not, um, we're not trying to offend you in any way. Yes. Come on, be brave. Now this one is quite young, he probably stands at about, who I don't know, three meters, Brian? Ten feet or so? Probably a bit more than that. I mean, a little bit more than that. Anyway, he's he's not particularly tall yet. He's quite a lot shorter than an adult female even. And so he's making his way in the world and he's got past the kind of really vulnerable stage of being a tiny little giraffe. He's probably, I would say, he, maybe 18 months to two years old. There he goes. Now, while he's walking down, I think we should go onto the damn wall there, because I think we'll get a better view. I also think there's some elephants coming down here, and so we might catch them as well. <laughs> now, I'm told that it was 38 degrees here, that's 101 degrees Fahrenheit, it was quite warm. I don't feel like it's that hot. Brian, do you think it's that warm? Uh, I'd say maybe 32. I would say around about 32 as well, which would put us at roughly, well, almost 90, not quite. And there you can see the leaden skies coming from the west. That is the direction from which the wind is blowing. And of course, in this particularly politically tumultuous time in South Africa, uh, it, it behoves me to say that, of course, the clouds out here behave rather like the politicians of this country. They promise a great deal and deliver very little. Right, everybody, joy and rapture unforeseen. We have found and managed to get hold of Taylor. She has found some lions. Let's go and say hello to her. Good afternoon, everyone. Just in case you thought that perhaps I had been swallowed whole by Arethusa, I have not. We have located the Talala Pride. And in case you've forgotten me because I've been on holiday for a few days, my name's Taylor and on camera with me we've got David. And let's have another look at these fantastic lions. So it's great to be back at work. I've missed you all very, very much. And I'm very excited to get back into it. It feels like I have drank an energy drink today because I'm buzzing. But I think that's just because I'm so excited to be back on drive and to be back in the wonderful wilderness. And and uh, not in the concrete jungle anymore. Sorry everybody, I think my, I may be sounding a little bit. There we go, I just had to pull my hat around a little bit. I think my microphone got lost in my big mane. I think my hair's a little bit bigger than the mane that these young male lions have. Now, 
I don't know too much about the Talala Pride. Jamie very kindly gave me a crash course just before I jumped into Rusty and we raced on over to Arethusa. So if you know anything special about this pride, please let me know. You can either do that by uh, typing a, a comment on, on Twitter. You can hashtag Safari Life or you can send us an email at questions at wildearth.tv and I'd love to hear from you. However, something that I do know about this pride and I'm quite excited to see and it is a first for David and myself is the tailless female lion who's laying in the middle of the pride and as Jamie described her, she kind of looks like a burbul, which is quite a big dog and I thought that that was quite funny because I can imagine if you saw her darting through the bush and you just got the rear end of her, that's exactly what she'd look like. I believe she's quite old. You can see she, she does look slightly more mature. Her color is also a little bit darker. And then of course to have an injury like a lost tail. I'm sure you must have battled it out with many other lions. Many males that have come in and taken over various prides. Or maybe even an injury from trying to bring down a big animal. And we did see some impala that were lurking just to the east of us. Which is quite exciting. But they seem to have moved off now. I'm just looking over my shoulder. I can't see them anymore. Maybe they got wind of the lions. The wind is swirling slightly, which is great for us as well. Because we're hoping for a thunderstorm. So I'm, I'm even hoping for the thunder tonight. Because normally that will bring nice big downpours of rain. And the wind is changing. It's getting cooler. The clouds are thickening. It's quite exciting. And I thought I was going to be lucky coming back to work and have some action packed lion sighting and that's obviously not the case it's like everything's telling me just to take it easy today to just ease my way back into work although this is not really work this is this is too fun to be work and watch these lions in la la land and they're sleeping quite heavily I'm quite impressed that they're still here because I believe that they were around the same area this morning now it has been an absolute scorcher it peaked at about 101 degree Fahrenheit, which is sweltering heat. And there's not much shade on any of the trees that they're lying under. It's getting very dark all of a sudden. Hey, David, don't you think? Right. While I see what else is going to happen with these lions, we're going to sit here for a little bit. Let's go back to James, who's got the tallest of the African mammals. It surprises me not one jot that the uh, uh, lions are doing absolutely nothing. But this giraffe is moving slowly, slowly closer to the water. They are very indecisive. They are very nervous drinkers. Unlike many of the people that I know who are not nervous about drinking in the slightest. But this giraffe, especially on a Sunday, is nervous about pulling into the pub. And they do that, of course, for very good reason. They're nervous because of predators. There aren't any predators around here that I've seen. But it is quite interesting that they are so weary. And it's because once they are down drinking, once they've spread their legs, it's very difficult for them to get up and run again. Hello Kim, nice to hear from you. Thank you for getting hold of us as this giraffe decides to make one tentative step further forward. Kim, you say, why is it that I say giraffe numbers, or it's unusual to see giraffe in numbers of 15 or so in this part of the world? Kim, it's, it's quite unusual to see that anywhere, you know. It's not, it's not, un well, look, it happens. It's certainly not the most uncommon thing in the world, but it's not very common. And I say that because they just, they don't have a very kind of, um, well, they just don't have a very social, social structure, I suppose. And they live in these kind of loosely aggregated herds where the females, they're often in sort of um, visual contact with each other because they are so tall, obviously, they can see each other and see long ways. But they don't live in permanent arrangements and especially young bulls like this so when you see an aggregation of 15 or so it's very seldom in fact it's almost never 
a, this is also very typical, come close to the water, turn around and go away again, then turn around and decide. That aggregation of 15 would have been a completely impermanent aggregation, that's why you don't see them all the time, and it's normally three or four females, often the bulls on their own, young bulls like this with a companion, there is a companion of his in the bush sort of off behind us. But I guess the reason they don't live in big herds is because they need to spread out in order to feed properly. And also the great big herds don't necessarily offer them any advantage in terms of spotting predators. They're extremely good at spotting predators already because they're so tall. And I think one of the major reasons, good heavens, there's a very cross elephant behind us. I think we'll wait here a little bit longer and see if they don't come down. But one of the reasons, Kim, is that Giraffe inspire a response in many of the trees that they eat to increase tannin numbers. So if you have a, oh, tannin amounts. So if you have a huge herd of giraffe all feeding in one area, all of the trees in that area will very quickly become totally unpalatable. And so it's not always to their advantage to be in a big group. So I would say so those are some of the reasons that giraffe are not always in very big groups. Come on, don't be so indecisive. <laughs> no. It's so funny how they do this. They'll probably turn around again just now and look at us. I think it might also be the fact that he thinks we're just slightly too close to him. We'll give him another two minutes. There are zebra all over the place, buffalo, I've seen a few of them. We'll go and have a look at them shortly. It's a very, very pretty afternoon. I love these afternoons of early summer when the clouds are burgeoning. And as I speak of zebra, before we can show you ours, let's head across to Stefan Winterboer, who's found some of his. I don't know if he's wrangling them. I think he's probably just looking at them. <laughs> I'm going to set it. Alrighty, excuse me being right up in your face like this, but we've got a bit of a focus problem with the camera. What I did want to show you, we've got some zebra standing behind us at the moment. What we need to do is no focus there, I'm coming closer, you can see my big green eye. <laughs> it's a bit of a joke. <laughs> but anyway, we have got, uh, we need to reset this camera, we're probably going to be doing it in the next couple of minutes or so, that's what we're going to be doing. <laughs> You know, you got to laugh. We are coming to you from Africa, from the deep dark in Africa. We're also coming to you from the middle of the bush on foot with a backpack. And of course, it's making things a little bit difficult from time to time. We are going to link to Taylor so that we can fix this camera. We'll be back with you as soon as it's done. <laughs> So David and I have been having a discussion as to how on earth do you tell that these scraggly looking lions, or three of them, are actually males. And I know that there's probably a few of you who have just tuned into Safari Life for the first time, so welcome if you have. So I'm going to start with the basics here. Now I know for the old viewers you know this timeless scene, you could probably tell the difference between a male and a female lion better than I can. But let's, let's give the newcomers a little go. Now, these are young male lions. There's three of them in this pride. They're about, I wouldn't say more than about two and a half years old. Now, if you look just behind their ears, you can see some fluffy hair. Can you see that in the wind? It's moving around quite nicely. Now, from as young as about six months, they already start to develop a bit of a mane. It's not quite much. They just look a little, their heads look a bit bulkier than the females. And that mane starts to develop first on their chest and then it starts to develop around behind their ears, which we can see now. And, and it would be really nice if he would roll over. Oh, he understands English. Thank you, Mr. Young Lion. Is he so kindly rolled over for us? You can see how the hair sort of just under his chin is quite long. So that's where it starts growing first and then it creeps around. 
around to the ears and eventually forms a bit of a mohawk for a year or so of their life. It looks like they haven't brushed their hair and it also looks like that awkward sort of schoolboy cut uh, that I'm sure some of you would have had to endure unfortunately uh, during your years of school. And that is the easiest way. Now if we look at a female, let's, let's go to the tailless female. Now in, it's quite difficult to tell the difference between the male and female now in size because these young males are basically the same size as this adult female. You can sort of see that if they stand up that would be really nice and you can really be, uh, be able to differentiate between their sizes. Now a female just doesn't have a mane. However, I saw something interesting. Just before I stopped guiding normally, I met a wonderful uh, South African family and they'd been to Zimbabwe and they showed me a photo of a, ma a, a, a female that had a mane. How bizarre is that? Now I'll see if I can maybe try and dig up that photo. I'll try and get hold of those guests and see if they can't possibly send it to me. That was the most bizarre thing I have ever seen in my life. Now that's obviously very uncommon and I'm not sure what would cause that if she maybe just had um, a bit too much testosterone in her body but you can see no no hair no long hair around the chest and like I said that's the first pace that have started to develop so if you're in doubt have a look around there and then you should be able to tell quite nicely they look quite fat from what I can see their stomachs are, are distended so I wonder what they've been eating it'd actually be quite nice to see the five of them on a prowl on a hunt I reckon it could be quite entertaining. I think it would be quite frustrating though for the old tailless lioness as she's got the most experience in this pride and I think she'll be having to do a lot of the hard work. Whereas these males, though, I think they've been out on their own a bit so I'm, I'm sure that they would have been able to have picked up a few techniques along the way on hunting and how to bring down the animals but I know that when the boys are hungry and when they're young they become very, very impatient and this can obviously ruin a hunt. I'm sure you've seen that time and time again where if you are not patient and it's the same thing with sitting with the animals and waiting for them to get up well then they're not going to do anything and I'd love to hear from some of you everybody seems to be very quiet today has nobody got any questions for me if you're wondering about my holiday it wasn't very adventurous like I said I was in the concrete jungle which was not as glamorous as it sounds I'd much rather spend my my days out here in the bush and I hope that we get to see it. Like I said, I hope we get to see a thunderstorm tonight. Let's have a, can we have a look at the clouds? It's quite nice with that dead tree. See how the clouds are coming over now. I know I've taken our attention off the lines, but I promise they're not doing anything too interesting. You can see all those clouds almost becoming one now. It's like it's coming in from, looks like where, is, where are the clouds going? Which direction are they moving? They seem pretty static at the moment. But like I said, the temperature's dropping and that's good for us. And as long as they keep thickening, and keep dropping in height and hopefully we'll see a few cumulonimbus clouds building up as well. Can I actually show you something? Darby, can you see those beautiful crepuscular rays? I'm just going to turn around. Look at that now. This is some of my favorite light that creeps through the clouds. Look at that. Can you see those lovely rays of light just creeping in all the little crevices of the clouds? And I think it could be quite a special sunset tonight. Hopefully it doesn't thicken up too much and we still get a bit of light. But I think these clouds would look quite beautiful with some orange and reds reflecting off of them. That would be really nice. So we're actually at Arethusa Airstrip so you can see the little wind sock blowing in the wind over there. We're just off here. So I'm pretty sure these lions have not been well rested today with perhaps all the aeroplanes that have been landing and taking off all the time. Oh, sorry, I'm being harassed by a fly now. As you can see, nothing much has, has happened. Oh, except you, one of the young males has raised his leg. Sorry, I'm swatting away, and I apologize if I hit my hat and make a noise with my microphone, but I'm being attacked by a fly. Go away. Be gone. Right, now I'm going to stay with these lions because I'm determined to see them doing something other than sleeping. And while we do that, let's go to Steph, who is on the foot. Well, we're back. We managed to sort our problem out quite quick and these zebra are still obliging us with their presence. And the one that's closest to us is actually pregnant, quite heavily pregnant in actual fact. And because 
the wind is blowing directly across both of us. So in other words, sweeping this way across our front. They're not getting a big nose full of my sunscreen and insect repellent this afternoon and that's why they haven't moved off. And because we've been relatively calm and because we've been here for so long, that's what happens when you don't hunt here in this area. Have a look at that. Lovely, hey? Now obviously if we had to walk a little bit closer or the breeze had to change direction and blow from us onto them, that'll change this dynamic. At the moment, these zebra are just happy that they can, without any trouble whatsoever, run away from us if we were to prove as a if we were to prove quite threatening to them, or if some dynamic had to change, um, you know, be it they can even change their mood, to be honest with you. That's quite a large zebra herd or dazzle of zebra as, the, as they like to say. I say we probably have zebra in an arc about this wide at the moment, with this being the back or the tail end of the herd itself. Now, let's see if we can get you a nice view of this pregnant zebra while they're busy cropping on the shoots of grass that have sprung up after that light rain we had here about two weeks ago now. Now from what I hear from, uh, from friends of ours all over the place is that Juma and the areas just adjacent to Juma have had the lion's share, so to say. You'll be able to hear it, but there is one lion that's been snoring. Well, it just started snoring a few moments ago. But I think with all the wind that's blowing at the moment, it might be quite difficult for you to see. Now, a lot of the game drive all the rangers have just started coming out now. The normal game drive is at four o'clock. So I don't think we're going to be able to stay here for too much longer. But perhaps if we hear if they get up to something interesting, we can always maybe come back a little bit later once everyone's had a turn. Remember, there's guests from all over the world who have flown a far away to come and see these amazing creatures for themselves. But lucky for you, you get to watch them every single day. And we hope to all meet you at some point if you come out and visit us. We can see them panting a bit there, it's quite hot. You can see them just moving around a little bit. There's a few flies biting them. Oh, we've got one that's got his head up, there we go. We can actually see a lion with his eyes open. Now, I know that you're probably all wondering with these lions being so young, if one day they'll be big and strong enough to be able to take on the Birminghams, and I know that Smiles for Rafi was wondering exactly that, possibly, but they've still got a good few years of growing. Remember, the Birminghams are in their prime of their life now. Now, these are young boys. Like I said, I'm not too familiar with this pride. They're, I reckon they can't be more than two and a half years old, if even that. So they're going to have to do another few years of growing and there's three of them I remember life is only starting to get really really tough now you think it's bad for when the, when the cubs are little those poor male lions when they get kicked out of the pride they spend their entire lives well not their entire lives but for a few years moving in and out of uh, territories and trying to find a place that they can just roam around and catch some food but remember how we've seen it how the Birmingham go go out on patrols they're constantly looking for any intruders so they'd have to be very very careful and they'd have to race away so for now they're going to lay low and I think they'll stick with these two girls or well let's hope the two girls stick with them you can see them they're fast asleep and it's cooled down slightly from what the temperature was earlier. However, I'm not sure if they're going to wake up just yet. Do you see her? How she just moved her lip around. I wish you could hear this lion snoring. It's hysterical. Can you hear it? Oh, okay, I'm going to keep quiet so you can hear the lion snoring. You're going to have to crank up the volume to it. It's quite soft, but it's really funny. Which one it is? Not that male. I think it could be the male. Uh, the one on the left. So we're just trying to work out which one is the one that's snoring. That, that, that way? Mm. Sorry. <laughs> I 
I think it's the one laying on his back, the one that was listening to me when I was talking to him earlier. I suspect that it's him. Oh, I've gone quiet. I think he's gone a bit embarrassed. Now we're only going to be able to spend about five more minutes with them and we're going to have to move out. It's quite difficult on Arethusa to get hold of any of the other rangers, so I'm sure they were quite surprised to see me here. You can even see those trees now moving quite a bit, which is good. Like I said, we want the clouds to blow in and thicken up. Those lions are going to have to find a better bit of shelter, though, because it doesn't seem to be any trees here that would keep them out of the rain. And they haven't barely moved. The only thing that's really moving at the moment occasionally is their ears and their tails when they're swatting the flies. And then, of course, their bellies as they're breathing quite deeply. But it's good for the lions if we have a bit of a thunderstorm and a bit of cloud cover. Maybe it'll give them a good opportunity to catch something this evening. Oh, goodness, that was a deep snore. You often see those lions laying with their legs up like that. Right, I think what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to slowly start actually making our way out here. Now, Rock, I know you were wondering which coalition looks after this pride. Now, it's funny that you say that, but there's actually some young males in this pride. There are three young males. This one that we're looking at is an older female. She's got no tail. She's known as the tail, tailless female. And then we've got three boys. So the one scattered up highest on the termite mound. And we've got him over there on the left, on his back. And then we've got one more who's laying in between. Oh, we've got that one, sorry. <laughs> I'm going backwards around. It's going to take me a few days to get back into it. And then the one that we started on, there he is. That's the other male. So, Rock, at the moment, these lines are moving in between territories. Trying to just keep away from the Birmingham boys, who are the dominant male lions in this area. Right, I think what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to try and reverse and get out of the sighting right after this question. <laughs> so I know, Roger, you were wondering, good afternoon to you, wondering at what age do uh, these lions, or w when will they first start to take their own territory? Now, it's obviously quite difficult to say because it depends on how strong the lion is and also how many there are in the coalition. We've seen that there are three here, which is quite nice. So something that will be quite exciting to see is that perhaps they're going to be able to, maybe in the next two years, because I reckon they're about two and a half, maybe two and a half, three years time, we'll see. Perhaps they're going to be able to challenge the Birminghams if other young male lions haven't come in already and already chased the Birminghams away. There's lots of young, young lions in the area. Right, now I'm going to have to unfortunately head on out of here. So we'll have one quick last look at this Salala male as he rolls around and does a bit of a stretch. But unfortunately I think that's all the action that we're going to see. So I hope you enjoyed the Salalas. But we're going to love them and leave them. And while I try and make my way out of the sighting, let's go back to Steph and see how his afternoon is going. If you catch us uh, just taking a nice stroll through what will be in a couple of months time, basically a, a swampy area or an area that will be covered in water. And what we're walking on at the moment is exactly that contact zone. That zone between the water, where the water has seeped into the ground during rainstorms or will seep into the ground in terms of, uh, in wishful thinking terms, and then hits a clay layer that lies underneath these hills or the underlying clay here and then gets squashed out. It's called a seep line. And this is probably one of the most pristine seep lines that we have at Juma and one that we've been returning to from time to time over the last couple of months. And I'm waiting to see, and I will return to uh, over the next couple of months, to see at what point, how much rain do we need? Because they're obviously all dry now. How much rain do we need before these springs start to flow? And what we're gonna be looking for is, is exactly this. 
This is a spring point. And in summertime, when we come back to this area, probably I would imagine January, February, somewhere around there, this area here will have a flow of water. So not only will it be a pool here, but if you had to scoop the water, you will see that the flow would be out of this bank here. There will be a flow of water coming out of this bank and will then flow over the surface for a little bit, not too much, probably until that tree that you see there. And then it'll sink down into the ground again and it'll disappear. But what we are now is, uh, is that seep line, is that contact zone, is that spring. And it's just nice to see, you know, it's nice to see. Here we've got a bee eater, have a look here. You know, it's funny, in exactly the same tree, a couple of weeks ago when we were last year, we saw probably the same bee eater. That's a little bee eater. You see if genre right here, it's gonna go back to the same perch. There we go. Now what we just saw there was a prime example of how bee eaters hunt. It's called hawking. And what bee eaters do is they look around for bees, silhouetted against the sky, will make a charge out to that insect, either catch it or miss, and then return to the same perch. That's called hawking. And bee eaters, of course, as their namesake suggests, feast on bees. They eat a lot of other insects. Let's see if it comes back, straight to the same perch. Boom, so another complete loop and out to, a, to exactly the same perch. As their name suggests, they eat bees. And one of the reasons why these birds that catch insects on the wing have retained that long beak is so that they can feed on these bees and wasps that have stings. You can imagine if it was like a swallow that uses a wide gape or a wide mouth and caught a bee or a wasp in its mouth, the wasp would sting it in its throat, creating some swelling and probably even killing the bird. But with a long beak, they catch the bee, they'll return to the perch and then they wipe the sting off all the time keeping that insect away from the face and then swallowing it. One of the more successful birds at eating bees and wasps. Out here it's only other insects that really have a chance to eat bees and wasps. Lots of spiders eat bees of course. The crab spider is a familiar spider or a familiar predator on bees. But these little bee eaters, and I just think they're so special this time of the year, hanging around in pairs with one another, monogamous pairs, but it's not uncommon in winter to find them at night, clustered up against one another. In this tree right here, this, the first upright tree across the bush. Of course, Jandre hunting for this little bird for you, very difficult. It's gonna, maybe, I don't think he'll come back to the same perch. So there's a prime example of what happens when you hawk like this. So they'll go to a perch, they'll hawk two or three times from that perch and then from there they move off and they go to another perch. And let's see if we can get closer to them. They will be nesting in a clay bank somewhere close by. Now it could be literally the home of an aardvark. And I know the last time we were here there were some aardvark burrows here. I just want to come into this place again. Here we go. So right here, where we saw these bee eaters the last time is an aardvark burrow. And I'm almost certain that these little bee eaters are nesting in the walls of the aardvark or ant bear burrow. Let's see if we can stick our faces in here. Obviously, being very careful not to disturb, well, to disturb something that's in there. You never really want to just go and stand in front of these things. They have the ability to become quite scary if you're not careful. So this doesn't have uh, anything waiting to impale me on a tusk right now. And I think I can quite safely, there's just a tree above you. Quite safely, there we go. And I think that we have exactly found that little bee eater's nest. Let me show you what I think is the nest. Right there. I think we're going to try and get you around this tree. Let's try and get you around this tree. Jean has obviously got a big aerial. There you go, almost out. There you go. He's got a big aerial on his back and we are quite agile out here, but not 100%. This tree here was what was blocking Jean -Dre. So come and have a look down here. 
This is that little bee eater's nest. I'm almost positive. At the end of that stick, you'll see a cavity there. And they dig with their beaks and their feet. They dig into these clay banks. And this being the only habitation right here that offers that sort of embankment, this I think is it. Now I'm gonna stick my face in here a little bit. I wanna see exactly what, how deep that goes. Yes, definitely. And I know that because that doesn't, it's not that apparent, but right there and there are where the bird lands. And if I look inside there, I can actually see the track of where that bird is walking and kicking the sand out of their nest. So that is the little bee eater's nest. Quite phenomenal. I must say that's probably only the third or fourth little bee eater's nest that I've found in the last 17 years. So that's quite nice. Putting uh, my observation skills and yours obviously to great use. Very cool actually. All right, now let me stand up so we don't impale ourselves on anything else that's around here. That was very nice to see actually. I'm quite proud of myself, I must say so myself. <laughs> Jean-André shaking his head as well. Oh, there's some rain. Come and look here. Now looking at that rain in the distance over there, that's probably falling over Sydney's dam. And it gives me a chance looking at that rain to answer James Richard's question on what date do I think the woodland kingfisher are going to arrive back in South Africa. Whew. Let me just put it out there. I'm just going to say the 10th of December. Let's say that. So James, I'll say the 10th of December. I don't know what everyone else has said uh, in, in the last couple of days, but let's say the 10th of December. I can't really remember when it was last year. I do remember distinctly hearing them for the first time on one of these walks, the woodland kingfisher pair that live at the dam. Um, and I'm being told now by Rebecca that it was on the 2nd of November that we saw the first woodland kingfisher arrive back last year. So maybe my prediction of the 10th of December was a little bit of an underachiever. Um, good question there, James. I don't know. I mean, let's have, I'll say the 10th of December. It'd probably be a little bit earlier than that. Who knows? Now, I'm noticing a bunch of sawdust on the ground. Have a look at this. That is sawdust. And if I put down this tree, you can see that the sawdust is quite obviously coming from this tree. But have a look here. There's sawdust piles on the ground. And there would lead me to believe that there's an insect busy eating this leftover piece of tree and would you have a look at that have a look underneath here those are called shot hole borers it's a type of beetle larvae that eats into dead wood and creates those little holes and we've got them all over the place here so shot hole borers that's quite nice eating that that wood anyway james has got some giraffe we're going to send you over to him and catch up with you uh, later on These giraffe are not happy with each other. They're having a bit of a sparring match, everybody. Cage fighting here at Treehouse Dam. Oh, that was dramatic, wasn't it, Brian? <laughs> There's a really dramatic headbutt going on there. They are having a bit of a sparring time, everyone. There we go. You can... it, it has been more exciting than that, I promise. Anyway, while we wait for them to get going, we want to know about the woodland kingfisher, and I must reiterate, it's not a woodland kingfisher, singular woodland in kingfisher, there. Uh -huh. um, last year we had it the 16th of November, James Richard thought it might come back on the eve of my 40th birthday, which of course will be on Friday or Saturday, but I don't think it's going to do that. My guess is going to be same as last year maybe two days earlier. I'm going to go with the 14th of November. No, I'm not. I'm going to go with the 7th of November, which is my brother's birthday. My brother doesn't know what a woodland kingfisher is, but still. Chip pir, Brian. Oh dear, Brian also chose the 7th of November. 
All right, Brian. Well, I thought I chose a different one. Brian thought he chose a different one, Rebecca. And that giraffe is now fueling himself on some guari bush. Now, what happens here, everyone? Watch this. This is fascinating. Often, yep, I knew that was going to happen. Often what happens here is as a dominance display, male giraffe will mount smaller ones. And it gave rise to the very interesting discussion point on whether or not giraffe showed or exhibited homosexuality, which is quite interesting. And uh, I think it's more of a dominance display, and that's not to say that homosexuality doesn't occur in giraffe or any other species. But I think here it's most likely to be a dominance display. Especially as the one is very clearly bigger than the other. But the little one started this fight. He came up to the bigger one and started flapping his head towards the little towards the bigger one. And you can also see and you don't often see it, of course, this is why their horns are bald. Because they hit each other like this and they scrape those horns against each other and the hair eventually comes out. You might just be able to pick up a little bit of wind blowing in. There has been some rain off to the west. We've seen it sort of dripping out of the sky, the lines of moisture falling. I'm not sure if where Taylor is on Arethusa, if there's any rain there. Anyway, the other thing we heard, not too far from here, some squirrels alarm calling. Brian reckons probably at that tawny eagle that we were looking at earlier. I think Brian, unfortunately, is probably correct. And I don't mean that because I'm resentful of Brian being correct. I mean that because I rather hoped that Karula might be around. But we're going to go and just do a little loop. There are two roads on either side of the drainage line that feeds from Treehouse Dam. We're going to do a loop on either, either of them, on each of them, and see if we can't find the Great Queen. That would be a nice surprise. You'll see that I've replaced the other hat. Very nice. Now, let's head across to Taylor. She is on Arethusa and she's got some pigs. family who does this, except my mom. My older brother's got his own production company. Mm. Oh, he liked us. He did MasterChef Australia. Yeah. No. I, yeah, but I thought like I'd be able to do something like this after I've been guiding for like ten years. It's so, like I didn't even. I didn't even think. All we got from final control there, everybody, was live, live. So I think we're live. Hello, everybody. We're live again. There was a lilac-breasted roller in bad light that I'm not going to show you. The reason I stopped to look of it was because Brent Leo Smith saw a broad-billed roller. I think it was this morning. Was it this morning or yesterday? Yesterday. And, uh, well, I'd quite like to see a broad-billed roller again. I think I've seen one in my time. Now this is the drainage line to the side of us here where the squirrels were shouting in consternation. I don't think I even mentioned the zebra to you there, everyone, that we were looking at while we were with the giraffe. But there are a few more of them over there. Not in very good light. Not light, I mean behind a lot of bushes. Hello Debbie, you want to know how old those giraffe were? Debbie, those giraffe, I think the younger one was probably just under two years old. Let's say two years old and the bigger one probably about three. That would be my guess. I, I certainly wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't bet my supper on it. But I'd say that was roughly the age. 
I'm just going to look around here and see if I can't spot some spots. Do you see any spots, Brian? There are some giraffe, not giraffe, buffalo. Now we'll go around and have a look at the buffalo there. But I don't, ooh. There's also a dwarf mangoose there. That's it. Oh, look at this. Now, I have been reading a fascinating book lent to me by Louise Pavid called The Bonobo and the Atheist. And it's largely about um, sort of empathy and altruism and morality in uh, our own species and whether it occurs in other species. And this guy reckons, Franz de Waal is the author, he reckons that this kind of principle of empathy, uh, which is exhibit, or not necessarily empathy, but social bonding and, and doing favours for others, if you like, which is what was going on there, is a really, really important part of how animals maintain social bonds and and um, and hierarchy, hierarchical structures. And increasingly, it's being found that what they do, oh, there's a buffalo in front of us, what they do is they do that kind of grooming after there's been some kind of spat or disagreement, and that's to sort of make up with each other, which I think is just fascinating. There we have. I think this is a small breeding herd, you know, or just bulls. I think it's just bulls, actually. This guy has got very square horns coming towards us. Now I'm just going to sneak slightly forward. Now it is a little breeding herd. A very little breeding herd. Get out of your way. There you are. How do we know it's a breeding herd? Well, we can see that there's a cow, two cows in front there. That's them. They have no helmets. They do not wear hats. Unlike the bull there, who is wearing a helmet? And that is because in order to instill a great favor uh, in the women, he must bash his head against another male in order to inspire affection from the women. And he, for that, he must have a helmet. Not so, Brian. Yeah. Otherwise, he would need some form of painkiller yeah. to stave off the concussion and headache pain. There is a lilac-breasted roller. Come on, do your little roll for us. This is quite cool, everyone. Let's keep an eye on him. Oh, don't do that. Turn around, bird. Here he comes. He's going to do it. I think he's going to do it. He will. Come on, bird. Don't let me down. Here he goes. Here he goes. It's so cool. <laughs> it's mostly cool because he actually did it when I said he was going to. Which is very unusual. The buffalo are deeply impressed. You see that, Brian? Yeah. They think I'm some kind of a wizard. Yeah. Not really, no. Fantastic. Now, there's another cow. She's been, well, she's had her face kind of done up by some... Uh, she, tattooed, I suppose you might call it. Um, she's had her face tattooed by ox peckers. They've taken all the hair off because there were lots of ticks there. And a virtual starling underneath. There's a huge amount of action around this area. And if we pan slowly to the left, what we will see in the distance is an... Oh, you can't even see it from where you are. Hang on a second. Brian, you're unsighted. We're not only with some buffalo. We are also in the presence of an elephant bull. And there he is.
Isn't that cool? And I'm sure this is all because there's a bit of water now at Treehouse Dam. Because there hasn't been water for some time, I think you'll find that the grazing and the browse around this area is probably in a slightly better state than it is, say, around the Jumapan, which has had lots of activity throughout the drought. Now let's see how this fellow is going to behave. I just want to have a quick look at him and see that he isn't in must. If he is, we'll probably just back off a little bit and give him some space. Elephants do like to use the road. And when you're that size, well, things just generally get out of your way. Which is uh, what I think we're going to do. I'm just going to move slightly forward and then slightly backwards off the road. Just to give him the opportunity to go past us if he wants to. And I see the buffalo getting out of his way very quickly. <laughs> Hello Jaden, aged seven. How lovely to have you with us on this gorgeous Sunday afternoon. You say, how heavy are buffalo horns? Well, Jaden, it depends rather on the buffalo. You obviously are much lighter than your father. And um, so a young buffalo has very light horns, but a fully grown big adult buffalo bull has horns that probably weigh about 44 pounds. So they were well, a skull with the horns about 44 pounds or so, 20 kilograms, which is very heavy. And we've got one, of course, in the tent that we pick up quite a lot. And it's very difficult to pick up with one hand. So I think maybe not quite 44, maybe a really big buffalo, 44 pounds. So the one we have in the tent, uh, maybe about 30 pounds or so. So it's pretty heavy. Here he comes. So we've moved off the road, We're not blocking his way. He can go any way he likes. But we will still watch his behavior very carefully and make sure that he is not irritated with us. No, he doesn't look particularly happy. I don't want to push this fellow. He's not very old. He's probably about 30. Which, of course, as we know, Brian, a young buck in comparison with some of us, we're shortly to achieve our fifth decade. I moved off the road for him for no reason. But also, you know what I've noticed? Is that we've had a little bit of rain, we've had the spring, and look at his condition. This elephant has picked up condition. I mean, I don't know him, uh, you know, I don't know him specifically, I don't think. But he looks in good nick. And the elephants were starting to look very ropey at one stage. Isn't he great? Oh, he's wonderful. Ah, cool. JJ, you say you think this Ellie was hanging with the buff herd this morning and he might be following them. Well, it wouldn't surprise me for the same reason as you might see um, you might see impala hanging around, or single impala hanging around with some kudu, or more likely, say, a, a, a single wildebeest bull hanging around with a herd of impala. It just gives them a bit of safety in numbers. I think they like the company too, you know. They're not always entirely um, solitary animals, elephant bulls. They do sometimes live in groups, and I think they sometimes like to live in groups. listening to the radio. No, don't think it's anything. Oh dear. There we are. On we go. I'm just listening, it sounds like it. 
a leopard has been found somewhere. Oh! I can't understand. I'll keep you posted, everyone. We'll just do a little loop around here, back towards Treehouse Dam. Oh! Can you get it, Brian? Oh! oh there it is. A little slender mongoose, everyone. Come on. Come on. No, nothing. Is he there? That's a slender mongoose. Oh, there it is. There it is. And we don't always have sightings like this, and they normally just scuttle across. And one of the interesting things is apparently why they lift their tails up like that is for crossing open areas uh, when they would be vulnerable to birds or death from the sky, as Brent likes to call it. They come flying, swooping down, have a grab of the tail, and of course the tail is easy to just drop. And so the bird will miss and fly off and be embarrassed. There it goes. I don't want to move because it's going to move. Marvellous. Right. On we go. All righty, while we carry on here and see if we can find tracks of the Queen, let's head across to Steph, see what he's doing on his fairly large feet. And here you are looking at the middle of a very rotten marula tree. This poor marula has had its bark damaged somewhere along the line, which has allowed fungus to get in. And the fungus has rotted out, completely rotted out, the hard wood in this tree. It's almost so soft you can, you can break it out. You can see here, I'm just using this warthog tusk to break out this, this piece. But have a look at what's happened inside here. There's a mystery here at this tree. And the mystery is, what has created this cavity here? And I think that I've probably come up with at least my theory on it. I think that the inside of this tree and underneath the resultant roots of this wood or the roots of this tree has played host to a termite colony. And what I think has happened here is an ant bear has dug in here, dug in under the ground, excavated the termite colony and then left and part of the tunnel's roof has collapsed which has allowed us this unique sort of view into the tunnel or at least where the tunnel was at the base of this ancient marula tree. But just have a look at the havoc that fungus and borer beetles, all those bits and pieces of sand basically is the leftover chewings of the beetle larvae that sometimes live in these marula trees for 10, 15, 20 years even. Some species of borer beetles can live inside these trees, just the rotting away. Now, it's just a matter of time before this tree falls over. Now, although it's still growing, it's still alive. It's only alive because the transport vessels, the xylem and the phloem vessels that transport nutrients made in the leaves down through the tree and water and minerals from the roots up to the leaves, um, is transported in the outside piece of this bark right here in this area, the xylem and the phloem. But the tree does need its hot wood for its strength and its uh, its ability to stand and weather storms and that sort of thing. So I have no doubt that this tree is going to fall over. Excuse me, I've got a fly busy buzzing around my head. I have got no doubt that this tree will fall over at when the next it builds up a bit of a resonance in a very strong wind, usually associated to a storm, and that is enough to crack this tree, to crack it over here somewhere or over here somewhere at this weak point, and the tree will come crashing down. Isn't this just fantastic? Now, I would fully expect that this tree would play host to a whole number of different uh, organisms. From scorpions, you get the bark scorpion that will love to live inside these trees, to all the burrowing beetles and all their larvae, cicada larvae, 
jewel beetles, two bees, two spiders. There's even a bee that's over here of a similar species to the bee that James has in that giraffe skull that is in the tent. This one's slightly different in that it doesn't have a waxy entrance to its, basically its burrow. It's just got this mudded, mudded up entrance. And I know that it's a bee because it came buzzing out when I tapped this thing a little bit earlier. <laughs> anyway, still doing quite well. I mean, I would imagine that this tree would even produce fruit at a time. Not something that I want to be standing under the, the, when it starts to blow quite hard over here. Have a look what we found here in, the, in, the, in this vicinity. We actually found these two things separate from one another. This is obviously the left top piece of the jaw of a female warthog. So it would have been the top of the jaw, it would have been this part of the face right here of the, of the warthog. And it gives us a unique ability to have a look at a little bit of the palate. That's the palate. Some of the molars. And then this massive incisor that can come out and give us a chance to look inside the basically the tooth's canal and then fit that in there like a puzzle. And it gives you an idea of how strongly seated. Oh, now I've got to try and see, I wasn't very good at puzzles, but there we go. It gives you an idea of how strongly seated the tusk is. Have a look at that. Have a look at the massive amount of bone that is on the top there. Obviously, to give it that strength that it needs when it's fighting, it obviously fights with these tusks. It'll hook up with the tusks, hook up, and it needs all the strength of that calcification and that bone in there to give the tooth its strength. It's just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, even now, you could probably dig a fair-sized hole with this thing. Excavate some roots if you need to. I mean, I'm no art fuck, but it definitely is digging with very much oh, ease. Amazing. Warthog tusks. Now, it's these tusks, them and the, the associated bottom tusks that give you the problem when warthogs come out and aggressively attack you. Now obviously we all approach, you saw me approach a warthog den or an artifact burrow with some caution and it's because of these tusks. So the warthog will come dashing out of the, let, we can use this as an example. The warthog will be living inside there. Usually they reverse into their tunnels, presenting the outside with their tusks. So the warthog would rest backside into the hole with its front side presented to the world and obviously enabling that warthog to come dashing out. Now they've got an incredibly strong neck. What they do is they come dashing out and they slice with their tusks. Oh, hang on. I'm coming undone here. All my paraphernalia. Oopsie, now I've broken it. Oops. Anyway, they come out with their tusks first and they aim they come at about this level and that warthog will aim to slash here with the tusks. And you can imagine what a warthog would do if it had to slash open this part of your leg. You've got a lot of important arteries. You've got the one big one, your femoral artery that runs on the inside of the legs and bang, bang, slash as it comes out. Obviously for leopard, that would be the face of the leopard or the face of the lion. I must say, apart from humans, it's not a very clever strategy. It, to, to be honest with you, warthogs get caught by leopard and lion so often that I would imagine that this sort of reverse in tusks out strategy needs to be amended a little bit. They don't seem to be particularly able to escape uh, leopard or lion attentions like this. But nevertheless, it gives you an idea of exactly how strong that is. I just find it amazing. Warthog tusks. I've also been playing with a piece of root as well. Two pieces of root in actual fact. These both come from an elephant excavation. Let me put this in my pocket. I'll give it to James a bit later. And these are two pieces of combretum root that have come out of the ground over here. That's the skinny one. This is the slightly larger one. And I just want to show you that you can use roots over here to tie branches. Now, one of the best knots that you can use for this sort of thing 
is a knot called a hitch and you can take it over and over so you make a cross oh. cross through there there's the cross <laughs> there's the cross <laughs> And then you take the tail end and you stick it between the cross. There. And then you tighten up everything. And that gives you an incredibly strong knot as long as you have tension on it. Now have a look at how much force I can generate with this root without it breaking. There we go. I mean that was me weighing about 150 pounds or feels like 150 million kilograms after my weekend of heavy eating this weekend. And that was just a skinny root like that. Can you imagine what we'd be able to do with a slightly thicker one like this? Well, we're going to be linking to James and an elephant soon. So I'm going to carry on with my rope. You'll probably disappear in the next couple of seconds. In any case, just to give you an idea. There we go. Definitely lots of strength. Amazing. Hello everybody. Sorry, we're having communications issues here. Uh, everything seems to be semi-open. Right, let's see if that sorts the problem out. Okay, there we are. Elephant herd at Twin Dams. A little bit of rain coming out of the sky. The elephants are quite close, but very peaceful. Which is a good thing with the close elephants, don't you find, Brian? Peace is a good thing. There they have been throwing mud upon themselves, or sand. Oh, and in the background, the red-chested cuckoo. Bit my flew. Look at this little elephant. Oh, it's a lovely time of year, this everybody, when the cuckoos are back. The trees have gone green. The promise of rain is in the air. And the odd spot of rain is uh, sort of, well, I can't see it anymore, but in this little puddle that is Twin Dams at the moment, just the odd spotting of rain. It's a wonderful, wonderful time of year especially when the clouds do build in the afternoon because the relief from the heat is wonderful and all the animals including the human animals love that feeling and they come out and you can just feel a kind of excitement in the air just wonderful stuff I'm going to sneak slightly forward so that we can get a better view of that little elephant. Hold on, Brian. How's that? It's all right. There we go. Now, of course, all of these trees have been mangled by the elephants during the drought or during the winter. And now, because they've coppiced or they're growing from the ground where they were pushed over, they're providing quite nice green stuff. They haven't died. They're producing green shoots. And also, they've provided shade for some of the most nutritious grasses. And the most obvious one to talk of there is something called guinea grass. Now, of course, most people, when you say, oh, I'm a grassland scientist, fall asleep immediately. Um, but grassland science, of course, or rangeland science, is actually pretty interesting uh, when you get into it. And one of the things you learn about is the fact that guinea grass, excellent forage for animals, and it likes to grow in the shade. <laughs> hello Gracie, aged nine. Uh, Gracie, hello. Thank you very much for your comment. You say, <laughs> did Jamie tell me about the fact that you all saw a very newborn elephant and 
it fell over and its mother and its aunt picked it up and helped it up and you say it filled your heart with joy you know why it filled your heart with joy it's the same reason well for one of the same reasons that we were talking about those mongoose a little bit earlier it's because we feel what we call empathy gracie which is a sense of um, we don't like to see other things suffering unless we're mad and there's some mad people but most of us hate to see other things suffering and that's why it filled your heart with joy and it's the same reason that that older elephant and her aunt went down to help the little one it must have been a very special experience to see that and i'm sorry i didn't see it with you oh our elephants have moved off let's reverse a little bit I'm also quite looking forward to seeing the cubbies of the Nkahuma pride. And I'm interested to see how that sort of uh, mange infection has gone. I'm told that they're actually not doing too badly. And I do think that that is a function of how much they eat. I'm not sure why I brought that up right now, but um, I think it was on account of the fact that Gracie reminded me I'd been away for a little while. That elephant has got much mud on its face. Do you think it did that for a spa, it's called like spa treatment, Brian? Uh, as Rebecca said, <laughs> Hello Kitty Kitty Bang Bang. You say, do we ever find milk tusks on the ground and is it illegal to keep them? Um, kitty kitty bang bang I've never found one I have found pieces of tusk it's not illegal to keep them if they are under one kilogram that is about half uh, at least about 2.2 pounds so if they're under that mass you can keep them if they're not then you have to register them they come and get an official stamp on them and then you have to put them in a stockpile or in a safe so we have a little sort of shard of elephant tusk or ivory that we use in the tent and it weighs 400 grams which is about well I mean it's less than half a pound it's roughly half a pound actually it's almost exactly half a pound and no it's not what am I talking about it's almost a pound it's about a pound and so we can keep that and we don't have to register it but yeah you've got to be very careful about it especially with the sensitivities around elephants and their poaching and all of that sort of thing now. Right, now we're going to go across to Taylor. Uh, the communication from the final control sounded as follows. When you wrap, head across to Taylor who got... Bye -bye. I'm back with a vengeance. But having a little bit of technical difficulty, but we got that all sorted now. And we've come and had a look at the dam in front of Vuyatela Lodge. And we've found an array of animals. And this female buffalo, as you can see, being one of them, she looks heavily pregnant. Um, she can see her stomach is quite round. And you can see all the ox peckers bobbing on top of her head. Now I'm hoping she's going to go in and give us a little bit of a roll around. She moved away from the bigger pan of water. Now you can see she's ankle deep in the mud. And if she is heavily pregnant, which it looks like she is, I think it would be quite nice for her to have a nice little cool down and some mud. It must be exhausting carrying around that big baby and that belly of hers. See there she, now considering uh, the drought that we've been having, I think she looks very plump to just, for it to just be a grass baby. I think there's definitely something else inside there. Now, the ox peckers often take full advantage when the animals come down to have a drink as well. Maybe we'll even get to We can, actually, if you look on, on its nose, there's, some ox, there's an ox pecker that was reaching down to drink. There we go. It's jumped to our side. And that's what they like to do, is, as well as eating all the parasites, as you can see that they're doing on, on the buffalo and the, the various types of animals. They also will a latch on, because they've got a really amazing foot structure, and they, we like to commonly call them clingers where they'll cling onto the side of an animal and then dangle off and have a drink. Now, you can see all their beaks are open quite a bit, so they are quite hot, trying to cool themselves down. 
probably quite nice if we can see them having a little drink. It's quite comical to see them dangling upside down and uh, taking a sip. One day I will get a f the perfect photo of a oxpecker utilizing, and I'd like it to be a buffalo, drinking. That would be quite nice, don't you think? I do, and if that day does come, remember to take screenshots. You can see them all nibbling away, lots and lots. Now it's unusual that this buffalo is on her own. I don't even see another buffalo in sight. I've even been trying to listen to perhaps see if the others aren't in the distance, but it doesn't sound like that. Now, normally buffalo will just give birth in the middle of the herd, unlike the impala and the kudu and the bushbuck and the waterbuck that will sort of separate themselves and go and give birth. They normally just do it right there amongst the herd and then hopefully the herd is either grazing or resting and then that little one will get an opportunity to get onto its feet and then be able to carry on moving off with the herd. Now this is quite silly of course for the buffalo. Not that I think she's chosen to be on, on her own on purpose because if there's a lion around, well, she's going to be in trouble. She's got nobody to come back and help her and her horns aren't as big as a male's. And she's not as strong as a big male buffalo. She doesn't quite weigh as much. She probably weighs between 500 and 600 kilograms. Whereas a big male can weigh up to 800 kilograms. Now she's done, so she didn't opt to have a nice little roll around in the mud. She's moving off. Perhaps she's had a drink now. She's not dehydrated anymore. And she's going to go away. There go the ox. Because there's lots of birds around here as well. <clears throat> now, you can see this buffalo. See, she's looking slightly thin. Uh, not too bad though. I mean, her hips are exposed slightly, and that's why I also think that she's heavily pregnant because of that round stomach. That the two don't really go together. She, she's listening. She's looking back. Perhaps she has heard something in the distance. And something that I've noticed over the the last, even just before I went on leave, I actually noticed it. And I know that Debbie has noticed exactly what I have seen and perhaps what Jamie and what Brent and what James have spotted as well, is that the buffalo are still on the slim side compared to the elephants, where the elephants have actually picked up quite a bit of weight in the last two weeks or so. And Debbie, you are quite right. You say that your you, comment to that with the buffalo being on the slim side is that is it perhaps because the elephants feed on a variety of different food not just grass not just leaves not just bul bulbs um, sorry <laughs> my mind went a bit boggled there but yes Debbie you're right essentially before I dig my, my grave a little bit deeper <laughs> this afternoon it's the heat that's gotten to my brain it is indeed because the elephants feed on a variety of different things it's even the impala the impala started looking a little bit on the slim side too but as soon as those lovely new grass shoots started coming through again and all the lovely new leaves come through they'll feed on a variety of different things now I did um, uh, chat to a few uh, guides that are guiding down in the southern sands and uh, they said that they're not hardly seeing any animals and that's because we had rain before them so while we had that beautiful rain they didn't have anything and fortunately they've just managed to get some over the last few days which is quite exciting however we're still going to reap the rewards of having that early rain and having all that lovely grass come through now all the new shoots on the trees coming through as well and I suspect that the animals are only going to start to head back south again in, in maybe a few weeks or so when all that grass is, has come through. See, are my birds still here? I think it's quite a few have a look. Let's have another look at the dam. I want to just show you. There's an Egyptian goose. There's two Egyptian geese, actually. You can see one at the water having a drink. Even when you live in the water, you get a bit thirsty sometimes. You can see all that movement on the water. That's not rain. Those are actually insects that you're seeing. You can see all that movement there. So don't get too excited. I wish it was the raindrops. We've got the Egyptian gear. I saw a la oh we've got what oh we've got lapwings. We've got blacksmith lapwings on the right. Oh there oh there, that's not a lapwing though. That looks like a turtle dove. Hello turtle dove. Everybody's come down to have a drink. It's quite funny how they've all come at the same time. If you go a little bit further right, you'll see those black and white birds. They're coming, they're coming. There's one. There they are. 
And you see them just up top. I don't know, there's a pair, Mr. and Mrs. Blacksmith Lapwing, and of course the turtle doves in between. Oh, I'm going to sit down. Oh, that's quite funny. It's not very often that you see the birds go down sort of a, a step below. I don't even know what you would call that behavior. I suppose it's just resting. But it's almost sat down on its... Mm, oh, the joints of animals is obviously a lot, uh, slightly more different to us as humans. I'm trying to think what you would call that. Would you call that its ankle? Possibly its ankle, maybe. It's just sort of resting now. That's hysterical. You know when it's quite funny to see a bird do this? is that when a stork does it. Now, I haven't seen birds doing this too often, but I have seen a saddle-billed stork, which is a rather large bird. And I came around the corner and I was completely confused. I was sitting in the long grass and I could just see half its legs and I thought, oh, I thought they were taller than that. That gave me a bit of a, a boggle the one day on Game Drive. I was very confused. Maybe quite relaxed. Normally we hear the blacksmith lapwings clattering away, making that very high-pitched noise that I can't make very well. And they are perfectly relaxed because there are no animals walking around here disturbing them. This is almost how we want to see these birds. Sitting here nice and quietly, just going about their day. They don't seem bothered at all. The other birds don't seem to be bothering them too much too. Lots of turtle doves. We're actually getting a few spits of rain now. Now... There we go, that one sat down quite nicely. Perhaps they have a nest nearby, I don't know. Could be even be sitting on a nest, this uh, Madam Blacksmith Lapwing, but I'm uncertain. I wouldn't want to go down and disturb them uh, too much. Now we're getting a few little spits of rain, but not very much, not anything too threatening. We've just got a dark cloud coming over us, I'm afraid. And it's been, I believe that you all saw a broad build roller. How exciting is that? I was extremely envious. I saw all the screenshots that all of you took it was really wonderful so thank you for that because I unfortunately missed the show and didn't get to see it myself and another bird that we are anticipating the arrival for is the carmine bee eater and I know that James Richard was wondering exactly when the carmine bee eaters should start arriving well you know it's hard with these animals because we say one thing and then they do something completely different my guess is going to be, what are we in now, in October, I reckon, halfway through November, towards the end of November, I think we're going to start seeing those carmine bee eaters, perhaps even a little bit later, if I'm not mistaken, I think I remember last year, down in the south, we only started seeing them towards the end of November, beginning of December, but perhaps we will see a few earlier, so my bet, my bet's a uh, between the beginning and the end of November. Let's keep our fingers crossed because those are lovely, beautiful birds. And I actually want to show you a photo because I know... Oh, hello. You probably all heard Rebecca talking to me there. <laughs> Before we quickly, I just want to very quickly... Oh my goodness, I'm losing lip ice and hand sanitizer. You won't believe what else I've got in my camera box. But I very quickly want to show you a carmine bee eater. I'll only be a second. I'm trying to get better at this now, trying to find things. Oh two six Ooh. oh right i'll show you when i get back folks we probably got one of the most dangerous things to uh, to encounter in the african bush that is a must bull elephant elephant bull in must he's busy trailing a herd that i can also see so i'm going to show you in a little bit we know he's a mutz bull. Have a look at the posture of his head, that, that head up posture with the ears above his shoulders and just that gait that he's got just tells us that he's just big and heavy and what a man. You can see that he's walking with that quite, that swagger that elephant bulls get when they're in must. Now we're pretty safe here where we are because he's obviously moving away from us, didn't really get to see us at all and uh, we're standing in the open. Now we do have a termite mound close by and that is the only condition that I would have gotten as close as I did to this particular bull elephant. Gives us a little bit of height above him. But he's moving off and I'll show you exactly why he's moving off in a second or two. And he's busy trailing an elephant herd. Now musk bull elephants are receptive to elephant females that are in estrus and not only are they receptive to elephant females in estrus but they actively search out herds of elephant. Now, what we're going to do is we're quickly going to spin around over here and see 
if I can show you this herd that he's busy trailing it. Gives us the sort of unique chance to see an elephant herd there in the distance. Now it's not always that we get the chance to look across a valley and have the target of an elephant bull. It's just such a unique experience. Mainly because the topography over here is a little bit too flat and lots of trees. It doesn't really allow you to see into the future, so, so, so to say. But in this particular case, it's allowed us to see where that elephant bull will be in the next couple of minutes. Now, Kat, you've just asked me if I've ever been charged by an elephant bull. And Kat, yes, ex I have been. And it's probably the closest that I've ever come to, to having a fatal accident out here was with an elephant bull in Mutz. We were on a corner and I bent down on a corner to look at some tracks and this elephant bull had heard us coming from a long way away and was standing dead still listening to us and then all of a sudden we stopped making a noise and he came down the road to inspect what we were doing and of course we were on the blind side of a corner and as we arrived as he arrived around this corner we stood up and this elephant was really close to us about five yards away and he got a fright and I got a fright and because he's so full of testosterone during this mutts period that these bull elephant go into, he immediately put his head down and he charged me. And I must be honest with you, it led to an encounter that lasted probably about 10 minutes of trying to create distance with this bull elephant that just didn't want to, want to allow us to leave him alone. And eventually uh, ended up with me having to dive underneath his trunk and tusks and run and jump off the edge of this drainage line to get away from him and basically this embankment that didn't allow him to come down the embankment but allowed me to create some distance and I ended up running away from him. That's probably about the closest I've come to dying out here was with an elephant bull in Muths, precisely like that one that I've just shown you now. Very very exciting these bull elephant in Muths. Now a lot of people say that you shouldn't uh, walk these particular animals, you shouldn't approach them, but in my experience, it's all just about respect. It's as long as we make sure that the wind from us is not gusting and puffing straight into his face, which will infuriate him, we know this, and as long as we create and keep that distance that he needs around him, uh, he won't give us any trouble. I mean, he's been pretty close to, it's just Jandre tripping over one of the only stumps that we've got over here. I'll show you. There's only two stumps in the, next, in the last 50 meters and he's managed to step Wait, over both yeah. of them. <laughs> now he's daring me to show you. Here. <laughs> he's, he's just bounced over that one. Now, I want to see if we can stay here for a little bit and actually watch that bull elephant go into that herd. That communicates, or elephant communicates, with infrasound. And those elephant, or th those female elephant, absolutely know that this bull is on approach to them. And if they've got calves, and if they've got youngsters, they start to cluster together, and they start to sort of want to protect themselves from this bull. And it's not because he's going to run in there and kill one of the baby elephant. It just, they tend to be sort of overly... Uh, enthusiastic at pressing their suit, I think, for lack of a better phrase. But we can see those elephants from here. We can actually just see the tail end of those elephants there. And we're going to wait here and see if we can see that bull elephant approach those females. We're going to send you over to Taylor now. We'll wait here and we'll see what we can, we can uncover for you. I'm with my book. I eventually found my page number and I hope you enjoyed that little segment with Steph. How incredible was that? So if you have a look here and you go all the way down, I apologize my hands are a little bit dirty because of the oil. If you look at this bird here, this is the southern carmine bee eater that James Richard was asking about. There it is. It's beautiful and pink. It's an unusual bird. You can't miss it and I don't think you can mistake it for anything. There's nothing quite like it with those lovely uh, pinkish colors and you know when I used to see them a lot is every now and then down in the south we would do burns these little conservation burns just to try and lower uh, the fuel load on uh, some encroaching bush and also just to get rid of the excess Murray bun so to get rid of all the the unfortunate the vegetation that builds up over time that is unwanted I'm just going to close the book and put it away and particularly the those carmine bee eaters we'd often see them towards the, the end of the year swooping down and catching all the insects that are trying to oh listen listen 
southern ground hornbills. Can you believe it? Now we need to find them. Where are you? I'm just looking over my shoulder. I'm trying to work out where they are. They're somewhere behind us. I hope you all heard that. That was so cool and I'm so sorry. I can see I get distracted very quickly, but I get distracted for the right reasons. Okay. There's so much that I wanted to show you because I also wanted to give you a sneak peek of the sunset. Let's do that actually. I want to show you a quick sneak peek of the sunset and then I'm going to turn around and we're going to go back and try and find these hornbills because I think they could still be in the thicket. So have a look at that. Now the clouds have opened up slightly. Sorry, I parked on a bit of a bump. And you can see those beautiful colours. Now we're going to do a follow up. We're going to wait until the sun comes through and below the clouds. And we're going to have another look because I think it's going to be spectacular. Now I need to reverse. I need to turn my vehicle. Well, I need to turn Rusty around. So let's turn Rusty around quickly. Because we are going to find these horns. I've only seen them once since I've been here. And they gave me an amazing sighting. It was quite spectacular. Actually, David, it was with you. No, no, don't worry, Ted. Don't worry. Okay. All right. Let me reverse quickly. I think... David brings much luck with the birds on the rain. Let's see. Did I see one? Did I see one coming through? Please be one. No, oh, please don't be a Logosaurus. I'll be devastated if it's a Logosaurus. Now, I, it has to be there because I don't know any other bird that makes a sound like that. And I know for a fact that the logs may fool us with our eyesight, but they do not make any sound. So let's look very carefully in here. See, I've got it. Found it. There it is. Can you see it? Okay, there it ran. There it's running. Can you see it there? Look, it's, it's quite difficult to see because of all the trees, but we found it. Now, are you on your own or are all your friends here? Now, we need to keep looking. You can see it just moving in the distance. This is so amazing. I love it when things like this happen. I think there's more than one here. I can still hear a few chat chatting away. I'm just trying to think. I'm just going to very quickly check on the GPS. I want to see if there's another road perhaps close by because they seem to be moving into the thicket now. Let me just double check. Mm, so you see me looking down here. I'm looking on the map. We are over here. No. Now, unfortunately for us, I have to turn this off. They have gone into the thicket, but I think it's coming out. Let me see. I need to try and go on electric mode. I need to try and stay as quiet as I can because they get quite start startled by the vehicles. Not necessarily the sound of my voice, but they don't like the vehicles moving around. And I've seen another vehicle. This is going to be so exciting. I want to try and get their attention. I'm going to... It's Mike. I'm trying to tell Mike to switch his vehicle. There's southern ground hornbills here. That's a, the reason why I'm making such a fuss about these birds and for the viewers who've been watching for such a long time, you know how special these birds are and we never get to see them. I think there's one that's going to come towards us. There's one's calling slightly to the right and I think it's going to join up with that bird that we've seen. So possibly they're going to come here and I think if anything we're going to have a good gap of them coming through this open area. I'm so sorry, I had to tell Mike. I couldn't let him drive past and his guests not see, if not the most rare bird in Africa. I mean, how amazing. You get to see all these lions and leopards and all these incredible creatures. But to top it off with a southern ground hornbill. Amazing. Right. While I sit here, I'm going to wait for them to come out. I'm not going anywhere. Let's go to James. He's got another feathery creature. Look, Brian, it's a broad-billed roller. Can you see? Oh, it's wonderful. What a beautiful broad-billed roller that is. Amazing. Amazing broad-billed roller. Ah, oh, I'm so glad we found it, aren't you, Brian? Yeah. Good stuff. Everybody, that is not a broad-billed roller at all. It is the lilac-breasted variety, common resident here. But uh, very gorgeous, nevertheless. The most gorgeous of the common birds we find. And to many, maybe even the most gorgeous of all the birds that we find here. He's found something very interesting off to the eastern side of where he's sitting, and there's quite a nice picture of him. Now that's the one thing I wanted to talk about here. The other is for me to 
be very quiet quite suddenly while I consider the question of Michael. Michael, I am thinking about your question. Just be very quiet, everybody, and have a listen. I don't think you can hear it, everyone. I can just hear it when the wind turns this way. It's the beating of drums in the villages. A long way, probably about, mm, say, six or seven miles as the crow flies. And, of course, that was a way people used to communicate out here. They'd send a drum signal on the wind across these great plains and woodlands. And that's how the original inhabitants, I suspect, did a lot of their communications. Just, I can only just very faintly hear it, so I'm, I don't think the microphone would have picked it up. But Sunday afternoons, often what, when the Shangan people around here do what they call muchongolo dancing, which is the sort of traditional dancing. And they have great competitions with huge big drums being thrashed. Oof, look at that. <laughs> Bit of a stretch. Beautiful. Righty, I'm afraid we did a whole sort of scan of the southern regions, everybody, but at the moment our comms are not working down there, so we're going to, we've come back north. And we'll see what else we can find here. We did find a lilac breasted roller, didn't we, Brian? But not a broad billed roller. Oh no. We'll keep going this way. We've also seen lots of kudu and many zebra. Watch out, Brian. There's a tree in the way. Right, there's a little clearing up ahead. Ooh, here we go. There is the bird that you heard in the background going. There it is, Brian. The Cokie Franklin with its golden head. Do not walk behind that bush bird. Absolutely no bravery at all. Lily livid little bird, there it is, it's coming out. I'd so very like to have a picture of one of them, but I'm afraid that one's too far away. They're beautiful. That golden head is quite something. I tell you, there's a sense of expectancy, and also in the background, I can just hear the odd rumble of thunder. It's a long way away, I don't think it's going to rain. But it does give the air a sense of expectancy. Just looking for grass seeds, hunkering down there to try and hide. Thinks it may have been spotted. It has. By us, I mean. And you can see completely hopelessly camouflaged against the green. But as soon as it goes out of the green and onto the sort of grey-brown earth, poop, disappears. It's brilliant. <laughs> cool. Cokie Franklin. Oh, there's a little clearing around here. I'm sure there'll be some impala. We have to stop for impala at least once a day, everyone. <laughs> Rebecca says, yes, that's true. They're very important. They are, Brian. I just don't know where to stop because there are a lot of sticks in the way. They're rather beautifully lit by the fading embers of the day. Let's see if they'll run past this gap. All right, on your marks. Get set. Go. There we are. 
They're not quite running yet, are they? They're not even power walking. Look how nicely lit they are. <laughs> and of course, we're looking at about a month now, just four short weeks until the newborn baby impalas are born. And Brent said that already a young wildebeest had been born and then eaten almost uh, immediately. It may have been eaten before it was born. I can't remember exactly. But the time of the lambing and calving season is very soon. Still looking for pretty, pretty skinny. It hasn't put on condition in the same at the same speed that the um, that the elephants did. There we are, just coming up to his second birthday. Well done. Fifty percent of your birth cohort would not have made it that far. Very nice. That was our impala sighting of the day, Brian. I think it was very wonderful. Right. We'll see how far north we can go on this radio channel. So just to orientate you slightly, um, quarantine is off to the eastern side there. We're not far from there, we're not far from home. And I believe the fireside chat has been moved, not from the time, but into the tent today. So it won't be a fireside chat so much as a, what should we call it, Brian? An intent chat. That's not very romantic, is it? Intent chat. No, it doesn't have the same ring to it as fireside chat, does it? We could do the fireside tent. It might result in the tent going up in flames, of course. Not be ideal. Okay, let's go and find out if Taylor is still with her grand hornbills. If not, I'm sure the lions are nearby. I don't want to say too much. We have found a hornbill in a tree. How beautiful is the silhouette? I know it's slightly distorted, but listen, listen, turn your volume up. Come on, come on, keep it going. It is honestly the most beautiful thing to be able to look at the silhouette of the southern ground hornbill with the beautiful African sun behind it. And then to have them calling, I've got goosebumps. It is so amazing. I, I, I just, I don't even know what to say. I'm a little bit speechless, so I apologize. But sightings like this, they don't come around. I don't think I've ever had the opportunity to see a silhouette of an amazing, I don't, I know I'm using amazing a lot, but I don't know what else to use to describe this bird. It's breathtaking. So take screen captures because I don't know when you're going to see something like this again. And we're in perfect view. Like I said, I gave you a screen, a little sneak peek, sorry, of the sun. We're just waiting for that sun to peep down through the clouds now. Now we often see the hornbills, the southern ground hornbills, roosting up in trees. And they normally just do this at night to rest, to sleep. And I know that P. Hart was wondering, where do they nest? Do they nest on the ground? And that's correct. They do indeed nest down on the ground. Very simple nest. I might just stop talking abruptly, but don't be alarmed. I'm doing it for the greater good because I can hear the other hornbill in the distance calling. So I'm hoping that this one that's only about 30 meters away from us gives us another call. So if I do that, I do apologize, but I'm sure that you won't mind it too much. Their voices are much better than mine. Isn't this incredible, watching it groom? Now, what I'd really love, but I think I could be asking too much, is if those 
two other hornbills that we can still hear calling in the distance. Perhaps come around here and join this, this hornbill up in this marula tree. Now it's not a particularly big marula tree. So I don't know if it's going to be room for all of them. But that is so special. Now I unfortunately can't take any photos of this just because it's a little bit too abstracted. But I reckon that at home you could get an incredible shot and I'd, we'd love to see them so remember when you do take a screen capture hashtag safari live if you're going to post it on twitter so we're just adjusting the camera there or wherever you post it just remember to mention us so we can all see something as memorable as this look at that look at this look at the sun coming out now on the corner of your screen it honestly couldn't be better and i'm sad because we didn't really get the rain. The clouds have now opened up again. But listen. Oh, listen, listen, listen. Crank that volume up. Come on, give a response back. They're calling in the distance. No, enjoying grooming itself. Now it's quite difficult to tell because I can also only see a silhouette of this bird but its beak doesn't look particularly big and I'm wondering if this is perhaps not a female that's up in the tree. Maybe, maybe not. I could be wrong. I'm sort of staring into the sun. And I wonder if it's that same family of four or perhaps it's another group. They're quite territorial though. I'm just having a look over my shoulder. Right. I'm going to spend a little bit more time with these hornbills. I think it could be quite beautiful if the others join. And while I wait for the perfect moment, let's go back to James who's got some elephants. We're quite close to this elephant, everybody. She's crossing the road in front of us on an elephant path. She just gave us a bit of a head shake as if to say, don't move. So I'm speaking very quietly in order that she might not become deeply irritated by us. Wonderful sighting. Really was special. She was only about five meters from us when she went, she shook her head. There they go. I think they're heading towards Sydney's dam now. Let's go a little bit forward. That was really special. Tiny little breeding herd of just three. And then we'll go up onto the sandy patch and have a look at the sun setting over the mountains. Look at the light. Isn't the light beautiful? Maybe they've already had a drink, but I think they'll probably end up at Sydney's Dam. That's a very reliable source of water for them. And there they go. Right, let's go up onto Sandy Patch and have a look at the mountains <laughs> and the sun. Just the most gorgeous afternoon. I'm told now, everybody, that things have changed. We won't be having a an intent chat. We'll be having a fireside chat. The rain seems to have held off. Right, let us ooze down the road here. Hello Debbie in Vancouver, you say what a glorious sunset, it's a glorious day, full stop, it's just so wonderful. It's warm, there's an expectancy of water, there are elephants everywhere, a couple of buffalo here and there, 
lots of impala, zebra everywhere. This is why we do the job we do, I suppose. You're just going to float gently into this clearing. If the old bat that is Jigger manages to get there without having to start the engine again, come on, come on, that's it, come on. She's not going to do it, is she, Brian? No. There we are. Just gorgeous, gorgeous, Brian, gorgeous. Hmm. <sighs> Sometimes it just feels like everything's right with the world, doesn't it, Brian? It is, isn't it? Um, now, you might just be able to hear it's not, in fact, the sound of drums so much as the sound of revelry. There's a party going on in Dixie. <laughs> There's also a fly having a party in my head. Hmm. And then just below us, thinking it is hiding from us with its clever camouflage, a very beautiful little bird the crowned lapwing. That is so cool. We'll just have a quick look now. It's paused on one leg, no doubt, closer to us, Brian. Right, right here. Look at that. <laughs> How cool is that? Hello. Uh, what you can see there quite nicely with it zoomed like this is the lack of a back toe. Now I've mentioned quite often that they don't have a, black, a back toe. They look like little ostrich feet almost. Isn't that awesome? Also, you can see that it has, well, it's gone to the loo on its own legs. Now they do that because uh, they like to, that they keep their legs cool that way and they've also got specialized salt glands but those are in their noses it's not that's got nothing to do with the whiteness on their legs but that is uric acid that you can see on their legs and that's because they urinate they defecate on their legs to keep them cool on a hot day like today look at the claw just going down into the dirt so delicate but at this resolution wow i mean it really does look a little bit like an ostrich that bird everybody stands from beak to the tip of its tail only ooh, probably about a foot long hello you can see why it's called a crowned lapwing little tooth at the end of the bill skulking about would not surprise me to find that they had a little nest here Hello, I missed the name, I'm afraid. It sounded like Lol. If that is your name, Lol, is that not a nest there? Yeah, oh, there's an egg. I knew it. Look at the little egg. Three eggs. Wow. I knew there was a nest here. How cool is that? I'm afraid, Rebecca, your comms have gone for a bowl of chalk. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody, we have got a new radio system at the moment, and every time somebody talks on the Game Drive channel and Rebecca tries to talk at the same time, you can hear it. Anyway, she was laughing at the sound of her own voice there, clearly. Isn't that cool? That's probably Mrs. Lapwing. Uh, normally, if you get too close and they're far away, they'll come zooping in, yelling and screaming and try and draw you away. But because we're so close, I think, 
she's probably just decided to pretend that they're not really there. Let's see if she walks onto them and sits down. How cool is that? And that lack of a back foot, of course, is one of the major reasons they must put their eggs on the ground. They cannot perch, they cannot sit in a tree. They are designed purely for coursing or running, a bit like us, with our heel coming straight out of our, uh, or our foot sort of extended entirely forward with no part of the limb in the back there. And that makes a very efficient bipedal motion. <laughs> right, sorry, there were two questions. One question was why do birds walk around with their heads bobbing up and down? Um, I think it's just a function of design. I think it's it's just uh, it's the same reason that a horse moves with its head moving up and down when it moves the shoulders that moves the neck muscles and so the head moves up and down slowly I think and I would suspect it's the same with a bird I think it also might have to do with their ability to judge distance so if you are trying to judge distance I don't know if you've ever done it but certainly if you've ever watched a monkey in a tree looking at you moving its head from side to side and birds do it as well sometimes when they're sitting still it helps them to judge the distance from the thing that they're going to attack so raptors especially will do that I, I don't know if that's why birds like this when they walk are doing it I think it's probably more physical than it is to try and get some sort of a three-dimensional view beautiful eyes there's the salt gland there you can see the salt now this is wonderful so these birds are independent of water and what it means is that one of the reasons they're independent of water and they can live on soil like this which is full of salt that's why it's so white is that they can exude salt they can excrete it through special glands just behind their noses and that is the salt that you can see there and that means that they have to drink much less than other birds. Hello, and another comment from, I think, what sounded like Robber B. And I'm not sure if that was the name or not, but Robber B, that's what you're going to be today. You say, it's interesting that the pupils are so wide. I was wondering about that myself. And I don't, I mean, it's not dark by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, I'm not sure what how dilated my pupils are. Uh, Brian, how dilated are my pupils? Uh, not dilated at all. Not dilated at all, yes. You see, it's not very dark, so I'm not really sure why it should have such dilated pupils. Perhaps it's been drinking too much or it's on an acid trip. <laughs> but I don't think either of those things... Wonderful. Right, we're going to move on. We're going to turn around and then head back because the communications are starting to falter where we are now. We'll just go forward to the next junction and turn around. And while we do that, we're going to head to for an update. I'm not sure who is, but I hope they have a lovely and exciting thing to tell you. We are in one of those bizarre zones here in the bush this afternoon where it just looks like the elephant have got the most of the trees over here. It just, to me, it just looks like, you know, nine out of every ten trees this afternoon has been absolutely mauled by elephant. And what's going to be quite interesting and what I'd like to do with you over the next couple of minutes is to see what trees the elephants have favoured. It's easier to see now at the end of at the end of October. This is our hell month. This is the month that I've predicted is going to be the most difficult for us to get through. The last half of this month. Today was just a uh, a taste of what's to come in the next two weeks methinks the heat and the just uh, the unrelenting hammering of the heat is what brings the rain and of course that's what we're hoping the most for but come along over here i want to see what trees have taken the brunt of the elephants 
attentions and I can start let's start here this is the round leaf bloodwood that has been a bit mauled by the Ellies but not this season here we have a combretum this is one of the bush willows it's been knocked over some of the leaves have been fed on but mostly the roots and I've noticed that over the last couple of days and then as we look forward into this glade we've got what have we got over here we've got some more bush willow we've got a sickle bush a zebra wood in actual fact not a sickle bush excuse me for that miss miss uh, uh, diagnosis there so that is a zebra wood much more combretums i mean just look at this now this glade that's been opened and has been cleared of shade is going to be a seed bed or seeding ground for grass now without trees pumping the water out of this area a decent sized tree can pump up to 200 liters of water out per day um, without the trees drying up the ground the grass starts to take root and that's what we think is going to happen now that's the succession that we think is going to happen now um, after the drought is broken we're hoping it breaks this year it may not of course the drought may carry on for the next year it may carry on for the next two or three years um, but what i'm hoping to see is these open glades like this become grass havens and it's going to be interesting to see that i must be honest with you i'm looking forward to see what exactly happens once the elephant now have done what they've done here's another zebra wood this is a square stemmed raisin that's literally been reduced to a bunch of kindling this is another round leaf bloodwood. They tend to do pretty well though with, with elephant attentions. There is a knob thorn that has been bent over completely. This is a buffalo thorn. This buffalo thorn has also been stood on and been trampled. Now, Carol, you've asked me, what is that tree that grows in twisted spirals? Carol, the only tree that I've seen here that grows in twisted spirals is these bush willows. They grow in this unbelievable, especially when they've been damaged, they grow in this, this snake or the serpentine twist around one another. Let's see if we can see it on this tree. This is one of them. I would expect this tree to have grown like that. You can see where there are two different branches over here, right from close to the ground it's usually those ones the ones that are close to the ground that grow in that twisted spiral but you're looking at the tree that I know to have to have that growth form in that twisted spiral that we see and it's just because these trees are so resilient to being damaged by elephant that even if they are coppiced from a young age they can usually grow uh, uh, they can usually grow and carry on growing without too much of a worry let's carry on over here carry on with our little exploration these are all just a mixture of round leaf bloodwoods a zebra wood and a knob thorn this buffalo thorn i was going to actually walk through that gap but i don't think jandre will make it i think this will pull his legs off he's got unbelievably huge calves and so i always got to take that into consideration when we're picking paths in the bush and something as wide as an elephant path is just wide enough for jandre's calves to make it through and then just lastly, we've got this marula tree that's been hammered by an elephant at sort of head level. But Taylor has found those ground hornbills and off you go, we'll catch up with you later. We have got them again. Have a look at this. Now they're chatting away and this hornbill that we can see has got some sort of insect. It looked like a quite a large grasshopper or perhaps even a locust. You can see it. Just, oh no, is it a, what is that? It does look a bit like a grass, grasshopper, like I'm going to stick with my guns. I got excited. I thought that perhaps it was a solifuge. It looks very solifuge color like, but I think it is a grasshopper. Now they are chatting away so beautifully. And I'm so happy that we've managed to get a view of this hornbill. And if this is your first time watching the show, and perhaps maybe you've just tuned in now, maybe someone texted you and told you you've got to watch this show, it's incredible. Lots of wildlife. Well, it is live, and we've been chasing these hornbills for the last 20 minutes to try and get a good view of them. And we finally did. Wasn't that amazing? You can see it just disappearing over there. I'm so happy 
that this one. <laughs> Oops. Sorry, I didn't. I just want to quickly get that question again. My my communication did all sorts of strange things. But have a look at the sunset as well. Now, Ashra, sorry, I apologize if I've got your name incorrect. The, my, I'm not hearing 100% correctly. But you were wondering how endangered the southern ground hornbills are. They are extremely endangered. Now, unfortunately, there's a, probably only a few hundred pairs, uh, maybe not even a few hundred pairs left in this area. The last time that I checked, there's about probably less than a thousand breeding pairs of southern ground hornbills left in South Africa which is not a lot at all so there are concerted efforts that are trying to breed them up and one of the one of the problems is a variety of different things unfortunately that are causing them uh, to be quite vulnerable but uh, something that we are trying to help with is that when a hornbill makes its nest and we were chatting about how a hornbill makes its nest on the ground they lay two eggs but unfortunately one is the only is usually only survivors it's very rare that two chicks will survive so what they're trying to do is that when they find a nest of a hornbill once the hornbills have laid their eggs they're trying to remove one of those eggs and then hatch them in an incubator and then try and release them again that's that's the idea and hopefully we'll get the the numbers up like that obviously there's a variety of different things because of various um, poisons that they've used to try and uh, control tick populations on cattle you know, unfortunately there was uh, a few that were are now banned like DDT that's not around anymore and that caused a lot of deaths I just want to look over my shoulder sorry just I'm hearing a variety of different things but I, I don't think it was a hornbill Perhaps it was an insect of some sort. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to go up a little bit further. I want to have a quick look and see if we can't get one last look of these hornbills. There's one. Found, found another one. Can you see it there? You can just see it in the distance and of course it's going to start disappearing. Now this is our friend who is up posing so beautifully in the marula tree. Now, here we go, having a quick look at us. Take some screenshots because these birds don't come around too often, though we seem to be seeing them a little bit more regularly, which is quite nice. And when I say regular, once a month is fantastic. Even once in a few months is even better. They're all coming out. There's another one that's going to cross the road. You see that one coming? We're gonna go to, I'm gonna duck down. You're gonna see it come out. There it is. Have you still got your gift or did you finish eating it? Now, just talking about how vulnerable they are, and I said to you that they lay two eggs. Normally only one survives. Now, unfortunately, that chick takes ages to reach adulthood. Up to seven years. And it would live with this group this family of hornbills and they will feed that chick until it reaches adulthood and then they will most likely stay with the family and carry on here's the other one so that's the other thing is that they're not efficient breeders either it takes a long 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 time that's something that we've also got to keep in mind this two, one. did you see that hornbill it looked like it picked a tick or something off of its body and then it thought oh well there's no such thing as wasting out here. Might as well nibble on a bit of that protein. <laughs> and then threw it back up and gobbled it straight down. And I just love the way how they open their wings slightly when they're about to call. It's so beautiful. Now if you've ever seen a hornbill fly, they're quite spectacular. They've got massive wings. You can see the little starling on the bottom of your screen as well. And they've got lovely white wing paneling. So it's quite interesting when they swoop around and you think oh what on earth is that big bird and it says hornbill now the last time that I saw the hornbills they were trying to evade us and one went and sat in a marula tree and David and I actually saw a feather dropped now we were uncertain there was a bit of a debate if it was bark or not and David and I went back and we watched the replay and it was indeed a feather however we did not find it, but I will. I will keep searching in that area. Maybe a gentle breeze took it and deposited it maybe a few meters away from where we were searching, but one day I'll come across that feather. And that will be a very, very lucky day.
I don't think James would enjoy examining a, th a hornbill feather under the under the tent, especially one of this size. Isn't that fantastic? Well, they're disappearing now. Oh no, look, they're up in the tree. We're going to get a better silhouette. I'm going to move forward. This is incredible. Just when I thought. Look, 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 look. How incredible is that? There we go, everyone. Here's your opportunity. This is so special. Now, James is going to drive into me because he's racing up ahead. James, look at this, James. Look at the hornbill. Bye, James. He's gone. He's raced past us. Look at these beautiful birds now the other one is sitting in the tree i don't know if you'll be able to see it because it's not as great of a shot but it's also hidden behind a fork but that's a great tree oh there's another they're coming look look at this oh, look at them they're all landing did you see that white that i was talking about one two three four there's five hornbills here now there's three on this tree i think there's three did you see three or there are only two here okay i could I thought I saw three, but there's two there. Sorry, everyone. I know I'm super excited, but this is so special to see something like this. I mean, it's one thing to see them down on the ground, but then to see them up and posing in the tree and just telling you about how beautiful the white feathers are underneath their wings. I mean, it couldn't have gone any better. I need to get my binoculars out because I want to have another look. I'm confused if there's... So please excuse me, I just want to check. Binoculars are very helpful tools. There are five hornbills here. The last time I saw a group of hornbills, there were only four. So we're looking at two, and then there's actually two in that fork of the tree on the other side. If you can see it, let's see if we can have a little look. They almost look like they're one hornbill, because they're so... No, no, if you carry on to the other tree where they were, there we go, down in the fork. You can actually see now, you can see that there's two. You see that? Isn't that spectacular? Finally! So I wonder if we didn't just miss one. We've seen how shy they are and they do tend to avoid the vehicle. So perhaps the other day we did just miss. We just missed the fifth one that was lurking. That's amazing though. Look at them all. Very interesting how they're opening their wings like that. Normally we see the birds opening their wings and sunning themselves in the morning. Now, just chatting about their posture, like I said, is quite interesting. And, and Green, well done for noticing. You're also wondering if that's their normal posture up in the tree. It's quite bizarre. If we, let's go to that the one, sorry, David, that one that's out in the open on the right. Don't you think it resembles something of a, corm, a cormorant or perhaps a, a, oh my goodness, I've forgotten my water birds. Oh, a bit of a branch just broke. Now, Normally we see the water birds opening their wings like that. Oh, look at that. Incredible. It just flew off and flying to the other side. When they're drying their wings, perhaps these, these ones are going to fly as well. So I'm not sure why they're doing, why they are sitting like that. It's quite bizarre, but quite beautiful. It's, it's not something that I could say is strange. I suppose I have to rephrase there and I apologize. So we do normally see them walking around, opening their wings. Maybe they're just giving them a stretch, grooming themselves in spots where they don't normally get an opportunity to. How amazing is this seeing five southern ground hornbills hopping around on a dead tree. And that's probably a knob thorn. It was once a knob thorn, I presume. And just resting here. I wonder if they're going to roost here. It wouldn't be a, a good place to roost if there was a storm. You perhaps want to... Maybe roost on something with a little bit more cover, but I don't think we're going to get any rain now. Downpour Dave also says he doesn't think we're going to get any rain. Now, we're going to watch carefully because if another feather drops, well, tomorrow morning I'm coming to this tree. Look at them. They've stopped singing now. They've all found each other. And often that birds communicate just to try and relocate and find each other, especially when they live in families like this. It looks like they're trying to get comfortable. Look at those beautiful wings. This has to be the best hornbill sighting I have ever had in my five years of being in the bush for every single day. What are you going to do? Are you jumping? Look, there we go. There, that's what I was trying to do. <laughs> Build up enough courage to leap across. Look at that. Isn't this amazing? I'm sorry if some of you don't enjoy birds, but this is just too special to not take full advantage of a sighting like this. 
Now, I hope that there are the five of them here, one, the dominant pair. I hope they do perhaps lay an egg or two eggs somewhere in the near future. I think it is coming into breeding season for them now, if I'm not mistaken. And wouldn't that be amazing to watch a chick? Imagine if we could find the nest and watch, like we watch the Wahlberg's eagles, and watch them grow and watch one little chick grow. Wouldn't that be so special? Now, this has been absolutely spectacular for this afternoon, and I hope that you've enjoyed the hornbills. But I think we're going to let them roost and go back to bed. And while we let them relax, let's go back to Steph, who's got a giraffe. Look at what's watching us through the undergrowth here. It's two female giraffe. They've just moved off. And no, no, not moved off. Three giraffe as far as I know. In the distance there, probably about 50 yards from us right now. Three or four giraffe. Isn't it just so special? The whole day today, We've been allowed such close proximity to animals while we've been out on foot and I don't really know what it's about. I, with the zebra that we were with a little bit earlier on this afternoon, I put it down to the wind direction being totally in our favor. The wind direction was in our favor with that big bull elephant as well. And now it looks to me like we've got the wind direction in our favor again. There is no wind at the moment. And that's probably why we're not gusting onto these, or our scent is not gusting onto these giraffe, or vice versa, their scent gusting onto us. And they know that they're at that comfortable distance where they can carry on doing what they're doing, but without our proximity influencing them, their behavior whatsoever. It's just so nice to be on foot, dead quiet. And now they've busy heard, or they heard me talking like that. They got a very quiz, quizzed look about themselves. And of course, going back to feeding is exactly what we want to see. So we're probably right on the edge of that comfort zone between them knowing that we're here but not caring, being too close and letting them move off, or being too far away that they're completely unaware of our presence. So we're right on that cusp, that very, very special and very difficult to achieve cusp. Where they know that we're here, we obviously know that they're there, but we're having no influence on their behavior or no change to their behavior, and we can share the moment together. See, the breeze has just picked up now. This light breeze that's blowing from the upslopes down the slope. They're busy eating. I just want to have a look. It looks like they're feeding on a tambuti tree. Difficult even for me to say from this angle. But it looks like a young tambuti. I'm going to say it's a young tambuti. Giraffe, and only because of this exercise. Giraffe at this time of the year, along with nyala and black rhino, and even elephant at times, will eat and feed on tambuti. And that's because because it's so dry and because there's not too much water around, the Tambuti tree itself has retracted a lot of the sap that it has inside of it, carrying all those poisonous compounds, and allows them to feed on the leaves during very specific times of the year, during the dry season and during the end of the dry season. It allows them to feed on Tambuti in the height of summer from about January through to about April. Only a very, very few select animals can actually feed on Tambuti leaves. They, this time of the year, feed on them. You do sometimes see it gives them a bit of a runny tummy, um, but or in particular in the case of elephant and black rhino, it gives them a bit of a runny tummy. I've never really seen a giraffe with a runny tummy. Put it down to it, I've never seen a giraffe with a runny tummy at all, to be quite honest. I think it'd be quite funny, actually. There you've got all female giraffe, and I know they're female even at this distance because of that tuft of hair on the top of their horns. If they were males, the horns would be bald on the crown, on the top of the horn, these have absolute, oh, except the one that's on the far left, you can see in contrast the two giraffe there very, very clearly. The one on the right hand side is a female, you can see she's got, almost looks like a matchstick or a paintbrush, 
The male, which is the one that's now hiding behind the tree, he's got the bald crowns to the tops of his horns, or as we call them, Aussie cones. Now, William, all the way from Oregon, you've asked me how a giraffe's vision is. Um, William, I would say that the giraffe's vision is pretty good. Not only do they have a height advantage, but quite often when you first see giraffe, they're looking straight at you. And in particular, when a giraffe is looking at a leopard or looking at a jackal or looking at some lion, it's the first thing that you notice is their vision onto something. So I would say that a giraffe's vision is pretty good. I would say that they see... No, I don't think they see in color. Let me just try and in my mind rationalize that. Why is that? It's because they don't need to judge the ripeness of, um, of any of the food that they eat. They also don't need to judge facial expression and complexion, much like we would or much like the primates would in, 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 at least. So they don't see, I don't believe they see in color and it would only help them to see in shades of gray, which would leave a lot more space uh, in their eyes for more uh, rods, which would give them a greater nighttime vision, which of course will enable them to avoid being preyed upon by lion. In an area that's as thick as what this is, giraffe will fall prey to lion Lion obviously need to learn how to hunt giraffe. They way, way above what the average prey weight is for lion, which is around about 600 pounds or so. Um, giraffe obviously weighing probably around about the 3,000 pounds for a big bull giraffe. These couple here will weigh around about 1,500 to 2,000 pounds of very heavy, incredibly powerful kick. Lions need to learn how to hunt these giraffe. But lions living in this area will know the giraffe are unstable when they get chased through thickets like this and through depressions like we've got in front of us. And because of their tall and their, their relatively high, small center of gravity, giraffe, it's easy for them to trip and fall. And of course, once they're down, lions can avoid their legs and jump onto their necks and their heads, which is the end of it for them. Well. We are going to link over to Taylor, who's got some impala for you, and we're going to carry on trying to race the sunset back to camp. Something that I haven't even really seen today is a beautiful herd of impala, which we are normally blessed with seeing every single day, and in numerous numbers as well. But isn't that just a pretty picture? As the sun has dropped now below the horizon, all those purples and pinks coming through and all the impala obviously I'm sure they if you're watching the dam cam perhaps they went down for a drink and now they're moving away towards quarantine open air it's lovely and open there as uh, you all know that's a good spot to perhaps rest and not be surprised hopefully by any leopards or lions or hyenas or whatever may be trying to hunt them at night you can see them there's quite a few and I'm glad that we have had this rain because we all know that the females are due to give birth in the next two months or so and we wouldn't want them. There goes a the game drive vehicle having a wonderful afternoon as we are and we wouldn't want those impala to obviously the lambs that are inside the mothers to suffer so we're so happy aren't you, that they've got all this lovely vegetation to feed on. Those lovely marula trees as well, those big trees all the leaves on, I can't believe it. I was only gone for 10 days and it's like the bushes changed completely. Everything is green. There's still a few sandy patches on the ground, but the trees are looking lovely and lush. And it's definitely becoming a little bit more dense, which is going to be interesting for walking. And I'm excited, as you know, I can't wait to eat all the marula fruit. I'm going to try and collect as many packets as I can, so that's something to look out for. I wish I could post some to you so you could all taste a marula fruit. It's quite special. Look at those bums grooming each other, grooming themselves, getting ready for what the night has for them. Perhaps they're going to a boogie. Perhaps they're going to have an early night. I'm not sure. Oh, and a zebra. What sneaky. Where did you come from? Just coming in from behind. I didn't even know that they were here. Well, it's quite typical. We normally see the zebra and the impala together, and I believe that you've been seeing loads of big herds of zebra, which is exciting. I did say that. I said after the first rains, I said we're going to see so many more a variety of species of animals and in much larger herds, but unfortunately this is not going to last for long. As the other areas start to get rain and the grass starts to come through, 
they're going to start moving to those areas. Like I said, soon the zebras, the elephants, they're all going to go back down south. But we're going to make the most of it while we have the privilege of seeing all these wonderful animals together. That is such a perfect picture. It's like somebody's taken a paintbrush and painted it across the sky. You've got the zebras, you've got the impala, the silhouette of the trees. It's incredible. And I hope you enjoyed that lovely shot. But now we're going to go back to Steph and see how he's coping in the darkness. I'm coping fine in the darkness for now, although it is getting dark rapidly and that's why we will be heading back to the camp when we can. But I want to show you the next endeavor that I'm busy with here. Here is a peeled stick. And um, this was from a combretum that an elephant had pushed over recently. One of those sticks that I was just showing you in actual fact when we were busy naming all the trees in that glade that those elephants had pushed over. And I've overcome my disappointment at my recent failures at trying to produce a fire by friction. And um, because I've overcome my, my, bad, my bad luck, I've decided to pick it up again. So what I'm making over here is a drill stick. This is going to be my drill. And this is going to be my base or my hearth board. And you can see I've made them from the same tree. The stick was in actual fact the same branch. This one was just much further down it was about this much of the that I chopped off what I'm going to do is I'm going to I've peeled this to try and make this one add it and the more cylindrical You're going to see me playing with peeling off slabs of bark like this. What I'm doing is cutting into this particular branch a depression, a circular depression, a circular depression. Evening and welcome to this evening's much anticipated fireside chat. Now, unfortunately, I think a Steph might have disappeared off your screens in mid sentence. As you know, bringing you a live safari from the middle of the African bush sometimes comes with its ups and downs of signal. Now, luckily, we have this burning bonfire to keep ourselves company on, yes. the, hottest, on the hottest day of the year. Oh, lucky. Brent. That's my fault. So <laughs> Thank you, Brent. It's, it's charmingly warm right now. I'm Yes, I'm going to try and shift back and make poor Brian's life terribly difficult. Right, so as I said, welcome to this evening's fireside chat and of course the much anticipated unveiling of the Birmingham boys' names. But before we go into that, James, yes. welcome back. Thank you. It is lovely to yes, have you back. Yes, I was away for a very long time. <laughs> it did, it, yes, yes. It, it certainly felt that way. Seven days. Yes, it felt yes. longer. Did it? Yes, it did. Well, that's good. We're, yes, we're very, we're I very glad to have you. My heart yeah. pined. Yes. 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 They are very good at lying. Can you <laughs> see that, everybody? They are excellent performers. These two next to me, uh, they probably felt like it went immediately. Well, like speaking that. of performing, we did learn from you. Did you? Yes. Performing. Yes. Yes. Quite good. Right. Excellent. <laughs> anyway, and on to that note, talking about the Birmingham boys. So, of course, it's come time now where we've spoken about it. James thinks has introduced the idea on drive. I've introduced the idea on drive. The fact that it is now time to give the Birmingham boys names. And why are we giving them names? Well, there's been so much in the way of the dynamics that have played out over the last year and a half, I would say. And the Birmingham boys have actually earned their right. They've got unique and individual characters. And the fascinating thing is that their dynamics are slowly developing in the way that they have evolved. So it's very, very important, especially because we get new viewers each and every day. And to be invested in telling these characters stories, a name is absolutely essential. And talking to a new viewer and saying, this is Birmingham boy number four, doesn't have quite the same ring to it as giving them a proper name. And that's what we've been up to. I think also the, um, 
I mean, we heard, I don't know if you've had this discussion while I've been away, but we had a big discussion about Cecil the Lion, and I mentioned him before I went away, and how Cecil basically changed the face of lion conservation. And if he had been called uh, male four of the of Pride Six in uh, in Hwangye, so M five P six H, nobody would have known. And his plight would never have been broadcast. It would never have been shared across social media platforms. And the very fact that he had what is unquestionably the wettest name any lion has ever been given, uh, well, that's beside the point. The point is that he had an incredible name and it's done wonders for lion conservation. And certainly when we went to the Mara and we saw those four lions that they had there, they've got four rather magnificent names, I think, especially Scarface. <laughs> it was a terrifying animal. And uh, when we were there, there were some guests there that came all the way from South Africa to see one animal. And that one animal was Scarface. And so, quite apart from the naming, uh, w or them deserving a name, which, I mean, I think is, uh, biologically, they don't really care whether they have a name <laughs> or not, do not. they? Um, but, but I think that it's, it's beholden on us to give them names, and hopefully, through their antics here, which we enjoy, they will take the message of lion conservation into the earth through you. The more people that get to see them and to become invested in them, the better. Yeah. And of course that left us with how do we name them. Yes. Um, and there was much debate and many, many emails about how we were going to go about this. And what we've actually, we've come to this point where in the future we've actually laid down guidelines, not rules, and just guidelines as to how we will go about this in the future. Uh, first of all, we will go for Shitsonga names initially. That will be our initial approach, and of course, taking into the characteristics, taking into account the characteristics of the animals as as a whole. So, if there's some identifying feature, something similar like that, that doesn't mean we won't use English names at all uh, if, if if the situation is appropriate. And again, there will be exceptions to every rule. Sometimes the prize will take the name of the area they're in. Anderson Mail, of course, is a complete exception. It's not named after a characteristic. But we have laid down some guidelines as to how we'll go about this. And JJ, you were interested in whether or not the local guides here will use the names. What do you think, Brent? I think it's it's it's, it's quite an interesting one. Yeah. Uh, I think to a degree, I think they might, it, and, and and especially some of the Shangan guys, because I mean they've heard their language butchered mm. for the last twenty years, uh, quite yeah. often. So, so it could be very interesting yeah. to see. Jamie mentioned Shitsonga, which is a, the kind of overarching linguistic group to which the Shangans belong. There's some debate over whether Shangans a dialect of Shitsonga or if it's the same language. It's really unimportant. The names that we've chosen, I think, are all Shangan or Shitsonga names. So you can use the you can use the two terms completely interchangeably. And we have run them by several of the, the camp members, but from Amanda and Herbie and Rexon, we've involved them all in this whole process. Right, so without any further ado, drum roll. Revelation. Do we want a drum roll? Let us announce the names of the Birmingham boys. So, first off, number one, Nsuku, meaning gold. That is a nod to Blondie, who of course is not going to remain blonde for very <laughs> no. long, but his eyes and his coat absolutely will. So, Blondie with his nick out of his right ear. Very big, one of the largest of the Birmingham boys, and probably the one with the fullest mane. And it's unlikely to stay blonde, as you say, as he gets a little bit older. He, unlike not Brent, but me, will not lose his hair. And so, Nsuku is how we say it. And that's the Shitsonga word, and it's spelt. I think it's important. There will be a yes, blog out. There will well, be there a, blog, a blog, but out, the spelling is very important. Is out, and the spelling, N S U K U. N S U K U. <laughs> Is that right? Yes, that is right. Okay. That is right. Excellent. So Blondie, he's got big scars around his face, two puncture wounds, a deep mark across his nose. Does and he have those two? No. Is that that's, that's, him, that's, okay. That is the next one. Ah. And so, on to Birmingham boy number two. And drum roll again. His name shall be Nena, which means warrior. Now, he is the Birmingham boy with the equal sign on his nose. Right. That's going to disappear, of course, yeah. as his scars heal. I think that is going to vanish. However, he is a beautiful looking lion. Uh, he's one of the older of the Birmingham boys. Um, and he, I feel, has earned his title of the warrior. Hmm. How much older do you think he is than the others? 
I think I think Nena and Blondie are quite relatively close. I think there's probably a couple of months between mm, yeah. the youngest two. Don't think two there's and more than a year. No, there's no more than a no year. No more than a year, so. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then, of course, we get to one of the younger members of the Birmingham Boys, one that we see more regularly than Nsuku and Nena, and that is Tinyo, Birmingham Boy number three. Now, Tinyo means a tooth. And I think most of you, our regular viewers, will be absolutely on board with why we have called him Tinyo. And Tinyo has a massive scar above his, on his top left lip, that has revealed his canine tooth and will, I think, forever expose his canine tooth on the top. I think a truly appropriate yes. name. Yes, I like Tinyo. That one. Tooth T I N Y O. That we spell Nena. We didn't spell Nena. Uh, Nena's no, an no we didn't spell spelling. Nena. Yes. You go for it. <laughs> well, the H is you good. take that. It is. It's it's N H E N H A. So Nena, N H E N H A. And if you're, it, it's pronounced basically N E N A, but the H just slightly aspirates it. So it's it's not quite. <laughs> but it's uh, it's halfway between Nena and Nena, Nena. Perfect. Sense of awe around. Yes, yes, warrior. Yes, oh. he's coming for you. Oh. Perfect description. And of course, he is one of the Birmingham boys we see the most, alongside, drum roll again. My favorite. Birmingham boy number four, whose name is Mfumo. And Mfumo means the authority, which I think is highly appropriate. He is definitely, in terms of physical size, he's. I'm, I think he's actually the largest Birmingham boy. I could stand corrected. It's been a long time since we've seen them all together lined up perfectly for that comparison shot. I think he is the biggest of the Birmingham boys. He certainly seems to get the attention of the ladies very often. Well, I say he wins the attention of the ladies, perhaps. Or oh, he takes the attention. He takes yeah. the attention, yes. Yeah. He, he claims the attention of the ladies. And, of course, over the last few weeks, we have watched him heal from a massive wound on the right-hand side of his cheek. He was the one who was very cleverly called by, was it the viewer or was it you? Uh, no, it was a viewer. Uh, who called him Fredefort. Yes. Which uh, was after the Fredefort Dome, I believe, which was a, a meteor, a meteor one landing the, site. One, one of the, the largest many. meteor impact sites in the world. Right. And that was because he had a great big hole in his face, yes. full of and maggots at one stage. It is healing up beautifully, but there was, it was touch and go for a while because it was, no, it's not healing up beautifully. That is, you're right, that is a, an entirely wrong description. It's healing up nicely. Yes. It is no longer looking quite so dangerous. It's very thick and pussy still, but I was a little bit worried that it was going to spread into his sinuses. And I think that the authority has earned his name because he fought off a seriously debilitating infection. You could see it was hurting him. He was uncomfortable, he was ill, he was just not so a happy let's boy. just get this straight. We're calling him Mfumo, the authority, M-F-U-M-O, correct? Yes. M-F-U-M-O. Yes. M-F-U-M-O, yes. Yes. It can also mean the one who ruled the authority. Because he managed to beat off a couple of maggots on his face. It was more than a couple of maggots. Was it? And yes, while fighting he conquered 12, them. He conquered them. He conquered he? those Good maggots. Good. And while fighting the mm -hmm. maggots, he did not forget his, uh, his mating rights. And Good he was, for him. He was on the job constantly while pouring at his face. That is very authoritative. Yes. And catching buffalo just, you know, on the side. Yes. So he, he's definitely right. performed extraordinarily right. over the last few uh, weeks. James, Richard, you say that you're quite pleased that they've all, well, you're very pleased that they've all got Shangan or Shitsonga names. We are too. For me personally, I think it's... Um, it's an interesting one because most of the animals around here have got uh, Shangan or supposedly local names. Many of them, and we will chat about this going forward controversially, <laughs> um, have got names that are either meaningless or misspelt or mispronounced. And I really like the way we've gone about this. We've gone to, to great pains to find out the correct spellings, try and find a name that is per perfectly relevant to the animals that we're looking at, and also to make sure that, well, to make sure that the due respect is given to the local culture and the local language. And in so doing, it doesn't preclude us ever giving an English name to no, an animal. No, absolutely not. So uh, that's an important one to, to note. Just as long as you never bring up Skinny Pom Pom ever again. Yes, well, I was going to, uh, you know, we I was leading hard. into that because I think Skinny Pom Pom, of course, <laughs> is the best lion name since Cecil. I'm sure Tinyo is very grateful that he isn't called a skinny pom-pom. Yeah. Now, now Cecil, worse. <laughs> Cecil, interestingly enough, do you know where Cecil comes from? 
There was a, a 50s movie, I actually remember watching it as a child, called Cecil the Cross-Eyed Lion. Oh, really? And he made, they made glasses and put it on to fix Cecil's cross. So I'm, I, I don't know I'm for sure, sure must but I, I'm pretty certain that's where it originally comes from. Oh, brilliant. It's quite a funny movie. It is, it is very funny. <laughs> when I was, I did Cecil watch the Cross-Eyed Lion. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. Um, many of you are very, very pleased with the choices, and I'm happy to hear that. I promise you we did think long and very hard. Um, and it, it really, it went on yeah. for a while, the, the discussion and arguing, not arguing, Endlessly. but discussing backwards and forwards on it. It's the most really emails I ever got from Graham Wellington. It's the ever. most emails you ever responded to. Yes. I know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, most of you are very pleased but would like a repetition, please, with pronunciation slowly, which is entirely fair enough. So shall we go from the top, James? Yes, would you like number to, one. Would you like to all no, yours? I don't think it should be. <laughs> I think it should be. <laughs> all right, who was number one again? Blondie. <laughs> Nsuku. Okay, Nsuku. N-S-U-K-U. Nsuku. That's a pretty easy one. It's just said as it is. Number two was Nena, the warrior. N-H-E-N-H-A. A slightly aspirated H or N, so it's Nena. Which, uh, I mean, look, they don't really mind if you don't say the aspiration. A very strict Shangan language teacher might be, uh, but... You can, you can pronounce it any N-A, if you're not in uh, the sort of Shangan land that we're in now. Then the third one, of course, is it's called Tinyo, the tooth. Tinyo, which means tooth. One tooth Tinyo, many teeth Matinyo. That's how it he goes. He does have Matinyo. And he does, only see one but we can only though. see one. So we'll just call him single tooth Tinyo. It's not the... Look, it's a very nice Shangan word. I mean, were you to call him... Tooth, for example, <laughs> it wouldn't have the same ring to it as Tinyo, the lion, <laughs> right? And that's T-I-N-Y-O, and then the fourth one, Mfumo, Mfumo, M-F-U-M-O, Mfumo, meaning he who chased the maggots from the hole <laughs> in his face. It doesn't Personally, really I'm, mean that, it means authority. Doesn't it does it? mean the authority, not the one he who chased the maggots, although right. he did, and he did very well. I'm, for one, I'm really looking forward to mm. using these new names. It, it really started to get to the point where you, you can hear new viewers switching, not here, you can imagine new viewers switching off when you're trying to explain the complexities of their dynamics and the number three did this and number four did that. It, it's much easier to relate when you're talking uh, about I'm positively name. terrified that I'm not going to be able to identify them. Uh, um, I, so <laughs> we will require your help. The tooth we can get. The tooth and, and, and the, the authority. Yes. The authority has a hole in his face, so he's easy. Can we go once more through the of the distinguishing features? So you said yes, Nsuku can. has N a Nsuku nick? has a nick on his right ear. Bottom right, isn't it? He has... I, um, is it? I remember looking at the pictures. Bottom right ear. Sorry, I'm touching my left ear. I, I I, think I'm, you, left and right, I'm not good at. Okay, he has a nick in his right ear. <laughs> and deep puncture wounds, I can't remember, I can't confirm. Deep puncture wounds on his right cheek and quite a big scar across his nose. He's beautiful. He's has got the darkest mane um, in For terms now. of its really, and the fullest mane. But remember, these characteristics yeah. will change. Nena, relatively unscarred face comparatively, with the equal sign across his known nose and a nick. No nicks. No nicks out of his ears. His ears are perfect. Um, Tinio is he's got the scar on his lip and he has got his right ear is slightly floppy and he's got a little U out of the tip. And then, of course, Mfumo, he's going to have a massive scar, for the rest, I think, for the rest of his life. I think there's going to be, once it heals, there's going to be a massive depression there. Okay. Yeah. Now, I've got a surprise that I think I'm going to spring on the two of you that I've been holding back. You're going to sing. Wait. Heavens no. You're going to dance. Heavens no. You're you don't going have your guitar. To... <laughs> What's he going to do? I don't know. I, yeah. I, I, I'm waiting as we draw towards the end of this fight. Oh, like that. I'm yes. too I, nervous. You, you all have to roar like a lion. Oh, do we? Oh, yes. Okay. I, I roar like a lion. Roar like in quite the Birmingham boy name. Yes. 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 Or, or you could roar in a, a Birmingham boy of a choice. Oh, yeah. Well. Right. I will do. <laughs> I will do Mfumo. Yeah, you chose the easiest the one. Maggot warrior. Here we go. I'll do Nenya. Nenya. <laughs> How was that? That was horrible. Oh. Are we are we roaring the name or? Well, I think we're running out of time, so we need okay. to make a decision now. Nena. There we go. Oh, and what would you like to do? Oh no, I'm now I'm panicking. Tinio. Yeah. Tinio. Nena. Tinio. Bye bye everybody. See you tomorrow at 0530.